Earlier today, the House Government Reform Committee held a hearing to examine Democratic political fundraising. Testifying, former Commerce Department employee John Wong. It's his first public testimony. Congressman Dan Burton chaired the hearing. It's four hours and 20 minutes. being present, the Committee on Government Reform will come to order. You may have a seat right now, gentlemen. Thank you. I ask unanimous consent that uh, all members and their witnesses written, written open statement, opening statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that all articles, exhibits, and extraneous or tabular material referred to be included in the record without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14 in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to Committee Council as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes divided equally between the majority and minority, and without objection so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that questioning in this matter proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to members of the Committee as they deem appropriate for extended questioning, not to exceed 60 minutes, equally divided between majority and minority, and without objections to order. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman. Um, now that we've agreed to some of these procedural matters before the Committee, uh, I read in roll call that you're planning to conduct your own internet broadcast of this in future hearings. And um, I, I think this would be a positive development if it's done right. I'm a little surprised because uh, you and your staff never uh, consulted with us about it. As I understand the House rules, uh, we would need unanimous consent to uh, proceed until such time as our committee rules have been changed to permit this uh, in-house broadcasting of committee activities, I um, would not object today if we could commit together to working uh, together, you and the minority, to amend the committee rules to address this coverage and to uh, provide, one, that the coverage will be in compliance with Rule 11, Clause 4, two, that the coverage will be fair and nonpartisan, and three, that the minority will have prompt access to a copy of the coverage. If you're willing to uh, agree to those terms, uh, then I will not object to, to having the committee go ahead with this uh, new uh, internet uh, live broadcast, uh, even though the rules, uh, until they're changed, uh, won't permit it. We agree fully with that, Mr. Waxman, and it's our intent to do that. If there's been a misunderstanding, we apologize because we have been planning on this and working on this for several months. One of the reasons that we want to uh, 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 have the internet coverage is, uh, first of all, it will give the American people uh, both the minority and the majority views on a number of issues. Uh, it will give them complete access to our hearings. Right now, uh, the media coverage of uh, some of our very important hearings have been rather limited, and in some cases, the media has interpreted uh, things that have happened uh, based upon uh, their own philosophy. Uh, we think the American people deserve the unvarnished facts in our hearings and in our uh, uh, investigations, and I think they'll get that because the Internet won't uh, leave anything out. We will make sure that the minority has full access to everything, that there's a fair distribution of the time allocated, uh, as we have in the past, to both the minority and majority, and we'll have the rules amended uh, the first opportunity when we come back in January. If, if the chairman would permit, I thank you for uh, that statement and your willingness to work together. I just have to say, for, for the record, that it makes me nervous when any agency of government, and of course our committee is an agency of government, controls what would be sent to the media. And uh, if uh, we have internet television coverage of our hearing, and it's our people or your people controlling who will be covered, what they say, not what they say, but who, who the cameras will turn on and, and 
things along those lines. Uh, I'd want us to make sure that the ground rules are absolutely pinned down to be fair. I sense from what you've said you agree with that. I do agree with that. And uh, on that basis, even though the Democrats on this committee could insist on uh, uh, on, on, on a vote of the change, to change the rules to be uh, taken before we would permit this to take place, uh, we won't object in, uh, to, for today and we'll work together for future hearings. We thank you, Mr. Waxman. We will now proceed with our opening statements. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody back uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a limited number of members who are here. Uh, obviously, we're in a holiday season, and a lot of the members had other commitments, so uh, we're probably going to have about uh, five or six members here for the questioning of Mr. Wong and, and his uh, legal counsel. But I do appreciate the members who are here being here, and uh, we'll try to do this as expeditiously as possible. Uh, because of the uh, tremendous number of questions we have, the hearing will probably take three days and possibly four days to complete. I know that's not good news for everybody. But uh, we haven't had the opportunity to talk to Mr. Wong or his counsel for uh, about three years now. And uh, since we have the opportunity, we want to make sure we make good use of it and complete it as, uh, as thoroughly as possible. I'd like to uh, uh, thank you once again for being here. I know your schedules uh, in your districts are, are very full with all the holiday celebrations, so I appreciate your being here. For those of you who are following these hearings, uh, this hearing is happening during a recess. Uh, and as I said, you won't see as many members of the Congress here as you would when we're in session. However, I expect other members to join us as we get underway, and they'll be coming in and out because of their schedules. This is a very important hearing. Uh, we've been waiting for three years to hear Mr. Wong's testimony. For the last three years, Mr. Wong has been one of 122 people who have invoked the Fifth Amendment or left the country. In our interim report, which we filed over a year ago, we noted that 17 people associated with Mr. Wong have either taken the fifth or left the country. The result has been a lot of unanswered questions. These are questions that the American people deserve to, to get answered. We voted to grant Mr. Wong immunity in October. He's here today to testify and tell his story and answer questions. In my view, it's better late than never, and Mr. Wong, we welcome you and appreciate your being here. I want to say just a couple of things about how we're going to proceed. This is going to take some time. We're going to be at this for several days. We have a large amount of material to go through, and there just isn't any quick and easy way to do it. Uh, I plan to work into the evenings if necessary, and I plan to go into the weekend if we have to. This is probably the first and only time that John Wong will testify in public, and we have an obligation to be thorough. In many ways, this is going to be more like a deposition than a hearing. Anyone who sat through a lengthy deposition knows that it can be tedious at times, but I think it's necessary to get this information on the record. Normally, before we hold a hearing, we have our staffs interview a witness. In previous sessions, uh, our staffs had deposition authority. That was not extended uh, during this Congress because at the time we uh, in, in initiated and instituted this Congress, we didn't think it was necessary. And when we have staff interviews or depositions, our staff goes over all of the issues with a witness in advance. That way, by the time we get to a hearing, we can focus on the most relevant facts. We have not been able to do that this time. At the time that we voted to immunize Mr. Wong, uh, Mr. Waxman asked that we do all of the questioning in public, and I agreed to do that. So this is going to be a unique situation. We don't know in advance what the answers to many of the questions are going to be. We have an idea because we received the FBI's interviews. However, they didn't cover all of the issues that we need to cover. At times, I think this will be very interesting, and at other times, it's sure going to be monotonous. However, we've been working on this for three years, and we've waited a long time, and I think we need to be as thorough as possible. And I want to thank everyone in advance for bearing with us. Before I talk about the substance of the hearing, I want to talk for a moment about the scheduling problems we've had. They could have been avoided, and what happened last week left me a little frustrated. My staff has talked for over a month uh, with Mr. Wong's lawyers, and we had planned to start these hearings yesterday for many weeks. It wasn't until last week after we noticed the hearing dates that Mr. Keeney uh, informed us uh, that Mr. Wong was scheduled to testify before a grand jury in Los Angeles yesterday. It was clear that this appearance had been planned well in advance, and I don't understand why we didn't know about this uh, earlier, but nevertheless, uh, we 
are here today. Uh, members of Congress had canceled events in their districts to be here yesterday. Uh, I had a subcommittee chairman who wanted to hold a hearing yesterday and we had to cancel that. Uh, so we uh, had that hearing delayed until next year. And uh, unfortunately, because of Mr. Wong's testimony before the grand jury yesterday, he had to fly all night on the red eye. He looks no worse for wear, but it must, must have been a tough night for him. Most people think that this uh, foreign fundraising scandal began in 1995 or 1996. It did not. This scandal was born in the summer of 1992. Bill Clinton was the governor of Arkansas and he was running for president. James Riotti was a billionaire living in Indonesia. Mr. Riotti flew from Jakarta to Los Angeles in August of 1992. He took a limousine ride with then Governor Bill Clinton. He promised to raise a million dollars for Bill Clinton's campaign. That set in motion a pattern of illegal activity that was repeated over and over again in 1993, 94, 95, and 96. Foreign money was funneled to straw don donors. Straw donors gave money to the DNC and other campaigns. Campaign officials claimed to have no idea anything suspicious was going on. It happened time and time again with John Wong, James Riotti, Charlie Tree, Pauline Kanchanilak, Ted Siong, Johnny Chung, and Mark Jimenez. The DNC ultimately returned more than three and a half million dollars in illegal money. And I noted that uh, uh, in the New York Times today, it indicated that uh, uh, that money was uh, uh, not illegal, but uh, I can't remember the exact word, but make, what was it, what is it? improper. Those were illegal com contributions, not improper. They were illegal. John Wong's name and Charlie Tree's name were connected to most of it. Since then, we've uncovered more illegal foreign money that the DNC still hasn't returned. In the fall of 1992, Mr. Riotti worked with Mr. Wong to funnel about $200,000 through Lippo Bank employees. It then went to the DNC, and it all went, also went to some state Democrat parties, including California, Michigan, Ohio, and Missouri. Normally, you wouldn't think that an Indonesian businessman would think of directing contributions to Missouri. Who was steering this money to all these states? That's one of the things that we want to find out. When we published our interim report last fall, we published bank records and memorabilia that showed the contributions were illegal. To my knowledge, not a penny of that money was returned by any of those campaign committees. More illegal money was given through the Lippo Group in 1993 and 1994. In 1996, the DNC received $450,000 from an Indonesian couple named Wiriadanata. Forgive me if I don't pronounce all these names correctly. The money came from Indonesia, from a close associate of Mr. Riotti. Mr. Wong was listed, listed as a solicitor of these contributions. This is one of the many issues we'll be asking him about this week. The big question is why? Why did James Riotti want to raise a million dollars for Bill Clinton's campaign? When you add it all up, the Riottis and their associates gave almost $2 million to the president's campaign and his other causes. Why? Did they like his health care plan? Did they admire his position on Social Security? I doubt it. There was an interesting passage in John Wong's FBI 302 interviews. They were talking about the $100,000 that Mr. Riotti gave to Webster Hubble. Mr. Wong was asked if there was a purpose behind this money. He responded, quote, everything has a purpose, end quote. I don't know exactly what he meant. That's one of the things we want to ask him about this week. I doubt that we're going to get all of the answers today. I don't know if Mr. Wong has all of the answers. We reviewed John Wong's FBI 302 interviews. If there's a reason or a purpose behind all this money, I didn't see it there. If we really want to get the answers, we need to talk to James Riotti. He needs to testify. Mr. Riotti hasn't set foot in this country in three years. I understand from media reports that his lawyers are trying to negotiate a plea agreement with the Justice Department. From what I understand, Mr. Riotti wants to clear away his legal problems so he can come back into the United States. If he wants to come back to the United States, the first thing he should do is come forward and explain his role in this whole fiasco to the American people. I think they deserve some answers. It's clear to me that the Justice Department had enough evidence to indict Mr. Riotti a long time ago. I don't know why he hasn't been indicted. 
the attorney general made a decision two years ago not to appoint an independent counsel she invited a lot of scrutiny when she did that will be watching very closely to see if mr reality is a sweetheart deal i know what kind of deals republicans got from janet reno's justice department there was a man named simon fireman he was he funneled about one hundred twenty thousand dollars to the bob dole for president campaign he got a six million dollar fine there's a company by the name of empire sanitary landfill they gave one hundred twenty nine thousand dollars in the illegal contributions to republican campaigns they were fined eight million dollars another republican who was responsible for fewer illegal conduit contributions than mr wong got a five million dollar fine unlike mr wong both of the republicans got terms of detention we'll just have to wait and see what happens with mr riotti the fact that James Riotti hasn't been able to come back into the country has not stopped him from keeping in touch with the president. He showed up when the president was in New Zealand for an economic conference in September, and the meeting was captured on videotape. Because Mr. Riotti has thumbed his nose at the campaign finance investigation, we wondered why the president would greet him so warmly and how he could get a seat of honor at an event the president attended. We asked the White House about the meeting, and they were quick to supply two tapes that the White House photographer took. And I'd like for you to see the tapes from the White House right now. That's the end of tape one, and uh, as you can see, it doesn't look like much happened. As a matter of fact, when the tape panned back to the president, he had just passed Mr. Riotti, and he hadn't really, it doesn't show him making much contact with him. Uh, and you do see a long shot of the wall over there where the TV cameras were. So let's take a look at tape two the White House sent us. Now you notice that tape stopped just as Mr. Clinton uh, approached Mr. Riotti. Now I'd like for you to see tape three. This tape came from a source not connected with the White House. Are you running the tape? a little different picture. The White House tapes don't show up, but President Clinton really did pay some special attention to Mr. Riotti. This White House is so consumed with covering things up that their taxpayer-funded photographer wouldn't even allow a tape to be made of the president shaking Mr. Riotti's hand. No one minded the president meeting Mr. Riotti. They just didn't want anybody to know how warmly he was greeted because of the problems surrounding Mr. Riotti. Did the president ask Mr. Riotti to come back and explain his role in this scandal? I don't think so. The White House has never shown an intense desire to get all the facts out. The president should ask Mr. Riotti and all the other people who stayed out of the country to come back and explain their actions. Some people say the American people don't care anymore, that they don't want to know the facts. 
well i don't think that's true but the fact of the matter is we have a responsibility on this committee to get to the bottom of it because illegal campaign contributions coming from foreign sources and foreign governments were given to influence the outcome of the elections in 1996 and 1992. I think the American people really want to know if foreign governments and foreign individuals are trying to influence our elections. I think they want to know who their government is beholden to. I think we have an obligation to finish what we started. We have an obligation to the history books to get the facts on record. Now, Mr. Wong, I've reviewed your opening statement and I read part of it in the New York Times today and I can't let it go by without some comment. You make it sound like people who are trying to get the facts out are somehow being unfair to Asian Americans. Nothing could be further from the truth. I want to make it crystal clear. Nothing in this committee's work should be interpreted as a slight on Asian Americans or any other ethnic group. There should be no roadblocks to the participation of any American, regardless of their ethnicity, in our political system. I'm very sympathetic to innocent people whose lives have been hurt by the campaign finance scandal. But again, let me make it clear. We have had, had to talk to a lot of people, and the Department of Justice has had to talk to a lot of people, because you encouraged them to give contributions, which was breaking the law. Because they looked up to you and because they trusted you, Mr. Wong, you were the vice chair for the Finance Committee at the Democrat National Committee. You're a very sophisticated player in the U.S. political system. You understand it. You knew the law. And when you decided to break the law, you caused a lot of people to be hurt. And most of them, unfortunately, were Asian Americans. I really hope you'll not try to blame the Justice Department or the Congress for things that you're responsible for. We have a lot of work to do. There are many, many issues that we want to question you about, Mr. Wong. I haven't even touched on most of them here. In the interest of time, I won't now. Let me once again thank you for being here, Mr. Wong, and I want to thank uh, members of the committee who traveled uh, during the holiday to be here with us as well. And Mr. Waxman, I'll yield to you for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I, I had intended to waive my statement today, but I thought more about this hearing, and I thought about it, and I realized that it was important to make some facts and observations for uh, the record, and uh, certainly part of the record for this hearing. The uh, Burton investigation started in 1996 after the LA Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, ABC, CBS, NBC, CNN, and other media sources broke stories about campaign irregularities in the 1996 presidential campaign. In the past 38 months, this committee has uncovered little new. But we have settled into a familiar and predictable pattern. Phase one begins with the chairman making a sensational and uns unsubstantiated allegation. After that, a newspaper headline follows. And then we move into phase two. When Mr. Burton pledges he won't rest until he gets the facts because the American people have a right to know. Phase three involves getting the facts, which invariably don't support the original allegations made in phase one. Now, that's a problem. Phase four involves the phase three problem. That's when the chairman accuses the White House, the president, Janet Reno, the Justice Department, or Democrats on this committee of stonewalling obstructing justice or covering up. And Mr. Burton generally says he won't stop until he gets what he wants because the American people have a right to know. Phase five is always interesting because that's when the White House, the Justice Department, or the FBI capitulates and we actually receive the information, what was said to be a smoking gun. But just in, as in phase three, that material never seems to support the original allegations. At that point, we enter phase six. Forget the original allegations, forget the facts. Pretend it never happened and don't admit a mistake. Instead, make a new sensational and unsubstantiated allegation. Go back to phase one and hope no one ever notices. 
There has never been a congressional investigation quite like this one. In three years, Chairman Burton has unilaterally issued over 883 subpoenas. And let me repeat that, because it's really quite unprecedented. 883 subpoenas relating to campaign finance investigation. To fully appreciate how astounding that is, consider that from 1960 to 1994, not a single chairman of any House committee ever issued a unilateral subpoena. It's simply amazing. Mr. Burton tries to rationalize this by claiming he's been blocked at every turn. But the fact is that the committee has received over 1.5 million pages of documents and deposed over 160 witnesses. Now, the uh, chairman indicated that in the past he's deposed the witnesses before he ever had the hearing. But today we're hearing from Mr. Wong without that deposition preceding the hearing. Of those precisely 161 people who have been deposed, only 15 were ever brought to a public hearing. That meant the rest had to go behind closed doors to be questioned over and over and over again about every detail, even some of which did not even relate to campaign finance investigation. To me, it was a could you imagine being called before a congressional committee and being forced to answer questions behind closed doors about every possible thing that the attorneys that work for this committee might think could be useful to try to trip you up or someone else up? Well, Mr. Burton asked this committee to immunize 12 witnesses. Now, the committee Democrats have immunized all 12 witnesses. The reason that's significant is that the committee needs a two-thirds vote. So they need our votes to immunize witnesses, and we've gone along in every instance, even in cases where it didn't make much sense. And the committee has had a virtually unlimited budget. We spent over $7 million in the last Congress alone. And we don't know the full figures for this one. What do we have to show for this, aside from the fact that we're now hearing from Mr. Wong? The Washington Post wrote that the investigation runs the risk of becoming its own cartoon, a joke, and a deserved embarrassment. The New York Times called it a parody of a reputable investigation. And Norm Ornstein noted that it was a case study on how not to do a congressional investigation. Reputations have been recklessly smeared. Some of those smeared have been public figures, like Bruce Babbitt, Maggie Williams, Hazel O'Leary, Cheryl Mills, and Janet Reno. Others have been ordinary citizens, like Professor Chi Wang, whose bank records were erroneously subpoenaed, or Chief Petty Officer Charles McGrath, the career military officer in charge of the office that was falsely accused of doctoring White House videotapes, and Colonel Raymond Wilson, another career officer who was wrongly accused of witness intimidation and mob tactics for trying to respond to a legitimate Senate inquiry. Even those who have done something wrong, like Webster Hubble and John Wong, end up in the strange position of being wrong themselves when our committee gets involved. On October 9, 1997, for instance, when Mr. Burton held his first hearing with a supposed blockbuster witness, David Wang, the Chairman promised that if Mr. Wang were granted immunity and permitted to testify, his testimony would show that John Wong, who's here today with us, illegally laundered campaign contributions while a DNC official. As the chairman put it, quote, this is the first time we have found an active person at the DNC who was involved in money laundering, and we will be able to prove that. End quote. Once granted immunity, Mr. Wang confessed to an illegal tax and immigration scheme that was far more serious than his conduit contribution violation. But he was immunized, and no prosecution could be taken against him. Even worse, 
the testimony he gave to the committee about John Wong was demonstrably false. His account was factually wrong and was debunked as he appeared before our committee. To this day, however, Mr. Burton refuses to acknowledge his mistake and admit that his allegations about John Wong in that particular instance were wrong. Now, if we don't have a committee owning up to uh, correcting the record, let's just at least look to the example set by the Wall Street Journal. They ran an article uh, last week, December 9th, highly publicized horror story that led to curbs on IRS quietly unravels in a Virginia civil court. And in this particular instance, there was testimony in the Senate about an, how an IRS agent stormed this man's home and restaurant amid a misguided criminal inquiry. Well, when they finally got into a trial, it, it became clear that those inflammatory statements made at a Senate hearing turned out to be inaccurate. If this investigation has a redeeming feature, perhaps it's that future congressional investigations will have a model of what not to do. The Burton investigation has suffered from at least five fundamental flaws that future chairmen should avoid at all costs. First, tread carefully when making allegations. I just mentioned the David Wang fiasco, but that's not the only unsubstantiated alle allegation uh, made about John Wong. In April 1997, Newt Gingrich, who was Speaker of the House of Representatives, alleged that John Wong, I'm quoting here, John Wong was clearly being given secrets while going to the Chinese Embassy, end quote. Mr. Burton suggested on national television that Mr. Wong, quote, may very well have given information that he shouldn't to the Chinese and others, end quote, and he could be a Chinese spy. Well, two years have passed, and there's still no evidence to support these over-the-top accusations. But they have resulted in over 7,000 news stories about Mr. Wong. And in a strange and unfortunate way, by raising the stakes, they have actually ended up minimizing the serious violations that Mr. Wong actually committed. Instead of recklessly crying treason, we could have worked together on a bipartisan basis to shine a spotlight on conduit contributions, but we didn't. Partisanship is the obvious second flaw of this investigation. Congressional investigations need to be bipartisan to be credible. And all wrongdoing, Democratic or Republican, has to be on the table. When this investigation began, I offered to work with the chairman in a bipartisan way with no holds barred. We'll look at campaign finance abuses, follow the facts to wherever they may lead. Whether they be from Democrats or Republicans, let's find out how this system is being abused and, from my perspective, to change what I think is an inherently rotten campaign finance system. Well, the chairman rejected that offer. I mentioned earlier that to date, Mr. Burton has just issued 883 subpoenas. 874 of those subpoenas have been issued to Democratic targets, and only nine have been sent to Republican targets. The fact is that the Burton investigation won't ask any questions about Republican wrongdoing. Last August, every Democrat on this committee sent Mr. Burton a letter asking that we investigate a serious conduit contribution scheme that involved Tom DeLay, one of the most powerful members of the House, number three in the Republican House leadership. A Republican business, Peter, businessman, Peter Claren, admitted to participating in a conduit scheme that he said was suggested to him by Mr. DeLay. Mr. Claren provided specific and credible information that deserved further scrutiny. Not one subpoena has been issued, no documents have been requested, 
and no hearings have been scheduled. Remarkably, Mr. Burton has never even had the courtesy to respond to our letter. Now, it's important to keep in mind that the illegal scheme that Mr. Claren participated in was indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the one Mr. Wong participated in. The only difference was that it involved Republicans. I know some people believe that there is more than partisanship at work. They genuinely believe that there is a clear anti-Asian bias and that Mr. Wong has received such extraordinary scrutiny and has been accused of treason, remarkably, without evidence to back it up, simply because he's Asian. Those feelings only deepen when one Republican senator called Charlie Tree's actions, quote, classic activities on the part of an Asian who comes out of that culture, end quote. And a House Republican joke that we've found only, quote, the tip of the egg roll, end quote. And people are genuinely puzzled why Mr. Wong is being singled out to testify for an unprecedented four days on conduit contributions when the FEC has investigated literally hundreds of individuals for similar violations over the past several years. Some believe it's simply partisanship. Some see a clear anti-Asian bias. Whether it's partisanship or bias, it's wrong. A credible investigation can't be selective. The Burton investigation th third flaw is inexcusable, incompetence. One Republican committee member called it frightening. Sometimes the mistakes, such as staking out the homes of innocent individuals, have been simply embarrassing. At other times, they are almost comical. When the chairman released doctored transcripts of Webb Hubble's telephone conversations from prison, the doctored transcripts quoted Mr. Hubble as saying, quote, the reality is not just, excuse me, the reality is just not easy to do business with me while I'm in here. That was the quote in the transcript released by the committee. The actual tape, of course, was significantly different. What Mr. Hubble actually said was, the reality is it's just not easy to do business with me while I'm here. Never mentioned reality at all. The bottom line is that careless mistakes undermine credibility. Just as important, bullying and fulminating should never replace genuine investigating. Our fourth mistake is that the committee has often used tactics intended to punish and intimidate witnesses into providing information. Witnesses who don't do what the chairman wants are routinely subpoenaed and threatened with contempt, even if they have legitimate reasons for their actions. One witness who crossed the chairman was humiliated in a public hearing simply for asserting his Fifth Amendment constitutional rights. Last, future investigators should, should not fall in love with their theories of wrongdoing. The biggest problem in this investigation is that Chairman Burton has been convinced from the start that he knew what happened. As the chairman said in one revealing interview, quote, if I could prove 10% of what I believe happened, the president would be gone. That's why I'm after him, end quote. And each time the evidence hasn't panned out, it's only made him more sure he's right. And it seems to have convinced him that everyone is in a conspiracy against him. The White House, Janet Reno, me, other Democrats on the committee. In recent weeks, it's even extended to the media. Despite the fact that it's been investigative reporters from the networks and other major newspapers that have uncovered the scandal, Mr. Burton doesn't think he's getting enough attention. He's accused the press of ignoring his work and keeping the facts from the American people. So now the media is also part of the conspiracy. As a result, the chairman has spent thousands of taxpayers' dollars installing this new camera system in the committee room so he can broadcast the hearings 
himself. His staff calls the expensive new system, at least they were quoted as calling it in the press, Dan Span. Some of you who have closely followed the history of this investigation will remember that last year the chairman directed his staff to build a fake brick wall in the committee room. It was on that wall over there. That too wasted taxpayers' dollars, and it end up, ended up ruining one of the walls in this room. And then the taxpayers had to foot the bill to repair the wall. I don't know if the new camera system will be worth the thousands of taxpayers' dollars we're spending on it, but it does seem to me to be yet another indication of lost perspective. I want to thank everyone for their patience in allowing to me to make my observations uh, part of the record, and I want to close with a final word about Mr. Wong. Mr. Wong, I think you owe the American people an apology for the conduit scheme you participated in. No matter how many mistakes the Burton investigation has made, nothing excuses your illegal conduct, and I hope you will take full responsibility for your actions today. And if any evidence surfaces that supports the most sensational charges against you, I won't hesitate to join Mr. Burton in condemning those actions. At the same time, if there is no evidence to support the allegations of money laundering, spying, and treason, all of which you've been accused of, I hope the chairman and others will acknowledge that fact and correct any false statements that they have uh, made. Thank you for this uh, chance to make these opening statements. I look forward to hearing your testimony. I'm prepared, Mr. Chairman, to be here at these hearings uh, as long as you uh, plan to hold it. Well, I'm happy for that, Mr. Waxman. Uh, I, I just might say before I yield to Mr. Micah for an opening statement that uh, the length of the hearings would not have been necessary had we had uh, the staffs being able to uh, interview these people interview Mr. Wong. Uh, Mr. Micah. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, could you uh, let us know exactly how much time we'll have? Are we going on five or ten to start? We're going to go on the five-minute rule. We wanted to go on ten-minute rounds because questioning. we thought it would be more thorough, but Mr. Waxman insisted on five-minute rounds, so <coughs> well, we'll start you. with five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In my five minutes, I... Minute, we're t you're not talking about the opening statement, though, are you? Uh, the opening statement uh, uh, will will allow some latitude there, but in questioning, it's five minutes. But I think the gentleman's been recognized for an opening statement, and I assume that those are generally, for members, five minutes? They generally are. Uh, unless you object, we'll try to give the members a little latitude since we don't have as many members here. As I, I, I won't know. object, but I, I think that was an answer to what I thought the gentleman was asking. Then when we get into the questioning of Mr. Wong, mm -hmm. as I understand it, we've agreed to a uh, half hour on the Republican side, half hour on the Democratic side for Mr. Burton and myself, That's and then correct. a half hour on the Republican side for the staff, half hour on our side for the staff, and then after that we'll follow the regular order of a five-minute uh, question. Well, the, the half hour on the, uh, as far as the staff is concerned it does not necessarily have to follow right after ours. I, I, uh, I, so I, we'll go, we'll go directly to the members after the uh, But those are, those are the rules. We're going to follow the rules. That's fine. Mr. Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for uh, clarifying the uh, time allocation. First of all, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, committee, I'd like to ask unanimous consent to insert at this point in the record uh, some some uh, documents and information. First of all, just to clarify the record, I think it's important that we list at this point in the record, particularly after the remarks of the, uh, of the uh, other side uh, in their opening comments, the list of, uh, I believe, 122 uh, individuals who either fled the country uh, or uh, fled the Fifth Amendment, and the correct number and that list thing I, I would like uh, inserted in the record without objection so order uh, furthermore I'd like uh, in the record inserted uh, I heard from the opening statement of uh, again the minority uh, referred to 883 witnesses called by this uh, committee in our investigation uh, from the hearing uh, in which uh, we had uh, director free and I believe mr. labella uh, and other uh, appearances before us, they uh, told us, uh, in fact, that they had uh, uh, subpoenaed as more, uh, more or as many uh, witnesses as we had, and I'd like that 
a correct number from the record. Uh, reserving oh, let, let me correct Reserving the right to object. I didn't say 883 witnesses. I said 883 subpoenas. Subpoenas. I'm yeah, sorry. I, subpoenas, I, think, subpoenas. I think that's what uh, Mr. Mike is referring to, but we'll correct they that. They did, in fact, uh, say that they issued uh, uh, as more, if not many, than we did. Uh, we also asked the question, and I'd like that made a part of the record, about the proportion uh, between Republicans and Democrats, and I believe that that is also contained in, a, uh, in this record and a statement by the FBI. I'd like that to uh, you know, entered into the record at this point. Also like to have rec uh, entered into the recommendation, into the record, the recommendation of both uh, the chief investigator, Mr. Lavella, and the director of FBI, their recommendation for an independent counsel, which is also contained in this record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, so ordered. I'd also like to have entered into the record uh, the exact statement and, uh, uh, and my question and response from the FBI director uh, in uh, hearings before this committee that never before had he seen uh, anything on the scale of, uh, of the activity that had taken place uh, that we were investigating. Uh, the only place I believe, and I'd like the exact, his exact response inserted in the record, was his in, with his uh, dealing and investigation of the mob. Uh, and I'd like those exact uh, words uh, put into the uh, statement at this point. Talking about Louis Fries, FBI, uh, the FBI director's yes, uh, yes, without objection. Statement. This is an important hearing, and why are we here in December, a few weeks before uh, the holiday season, uh, or during the holiday season for many? Uh, people may wonder. Um, the fact is that never before in the history of an investigation in Congress has there been uh, anything of the scope uh, of uh, corruption, of illegal uh, activities of uh, destruction and misuse of the campaign uh, process. Uh, we have also been delayed uh, by an unprecedented blocking of information, disappearance of uh, witnesses, a lack of cooperation, again unprecedented in the, in the history of congressional investigations. The other uh, reason we're here is that there have been supposed investigations and there have been active investigations going on uh, to this date and we have been kept from these from witnesses uh, and uh, from those we have attempted uh, to uh, learn the details of what went on until this date uh, those are some of the uh, reasons that we're here at this uh, late juncture I believe it's absolutely critical that we're here and that we continue to conduct this because uh, never before has the system to elect the chief executive officer of this nation, uh, has the system been so uh, corrupted uh, and the trail of money, whether it's foreign uh, contributions or conduit payments or whatever, uh, but this, this, uh, this, uh, has really destroyed uh, public uh, trust and confidence uh, in uh, our electoral process and particularly for, for the highest office of the land. So I think it's critical that we, one, that we expose the loopholes, two, uh, that we find out what were the controlling uh, legal authorities and if they aren't there that we make certain that we put them in place and the third, that we, uh, we disclose uh, violations uh, of uh, law and of that process that's so sacred uh, that, that defines uh, our very way of life in having a, a, a chief executive officer elected by the people in a Congress uh, that holds uh, uh, the whole process accountable and a, a committee and subcommittee uh, that I participate in that conducts investigations uh, and oversight uh, so that our system can be responsible work and that the American people can have faith uh, in that system. So with those comments, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Miker. Uh, Mr. Souter. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to uh, open with a, uh, a, a brief explanation from my standpoint of, of what I think we've seen uh, these last uh, frustrating five years. And one of the questions is, uh, what is really important? What are we trying to get at? And sometimes when we bring a witness forward, uh, we don't necessarily find what we were uh, uh, wondering whether there might be there. Uh, sometimes um, it seems that the administration uh, is protecting uh, lower level witnesses um, or, or under the guise of ongoing investigations when we're looking at some really critical fundamental things. For example, uh, I was one frustrated member of Congress during the impeachment debate because there is redacted materials that had direct bearing on that impeachment debate and we didn't bring them forth because our side thought that the president lying about sex with some little girl was more important than getting to some fundamental things and because there were ongoing investigations. And this type of, of frustration to me leads, and I think many American people are getting frustrated, what we know as a fact is that our national secrets went to China. We don't know how they got there. We know decisions were made that were incorrect and we don't know how they've got there. We don't know whether any individual did it, which individuals, which connections of individuals, but we know that certain things have happened in this country, and part of our responsibility is not to focus on little bits and pieces. And this is what uh, some of our side does tend to exaggerate on individual cases or get overexcited. During the impeachment process, one member of the Republican Party said that uh, the Free Label memos uh, alleged that it led to the President of the United States, which then was discredited because that's not what the Free and Labella memos said. What the Free and Labella memos said, which was damning enough, was that they believed that there had been a deliberate separation of the campaign finance investigations so that just like Nixon asked the Justice Department to do under Watergate, there could not be an attempt to see what levels this went up to, and it could have led to the vice president or the president, but they didn't know because there had been a deliberate attempt to see how all the pieces fit together. That's the problem with the 122 people who fled, is we don't know how the pieces went together. That's the problem with people taking the Fifth Amendment. The Fifth Amendment says you can't incriminate yourself. Well, if you don't have anything to incriminate yourself, you're not likely to plead the Fifth Amendment. Now, whether it was the matter we were asking is another question, but the fact is, is that if you take the Fifth Amendment, presumably, you've got something that you don't want to incriminate yourself about, and we've had 122 people do that. It's like a village that won't talk. And it has been a very frustrating process to the American people and to us. Quite frankly, I don't think that what we're likely to hear the next few days is going to lead us to any sweeping conclusions about any of the, the major questions. It's, it's just another piece. And what I saw in reading the 120 pages that, that I've gone through so far is the seamy side of campaign finance. It is not like other members of Congress, other presidents to compare what went on in this White House to other presidents and what goes on day to day here, which is bad enough. And I was hoping that these hearings, quite frankly, our committee and Thompson's hearings over time would lead to changes in campaign finance laws, but they didn't because they were blocked. Because instead we got into partisanship and there wasn't, because people didn't want to acknowledge that the origination of the year-round campaign in this administration led to a different approach to campaign finance it is like comparing the flu to cancer. Because with the year-round campaigns, with the taking of occasional use of the Lincoln bedroom into a constant hotel, taking occasional breakfast to constant breakfast, taking radio broadcasts that occasionally brought in contributors to a cash event almost every time, to taking a group of people like the Asians, we're not the racist. It's the people who told the Asians that the only way they could get positions in the administration the only way they could get to a radio address, the only way they could get to the Lincoln bedroom was to give money. That's the racist approach. And that we took it from what, when you can get it in the election year, people are focused on the election. But when you go year round, the off year is when it's hard to raise money. And in the off year when you're raising money, when you don't have an election, then you have to ask, what did the people want? And when we see money coming in from Chinese intelligence officials through some people, through the Riyadis and Indonesian interests in other people, through other people who uh, may want a change in, the, in a lower level decision on Indian casinos. We have every right in the world to have investigations and say, what is happening inside this administration?
that all sorts of decisions seem to be being made for monetary reasons. And that part of my concern in, in pursuing this is, is that there isn't an Alec but Alex Butterfield who had a tape that was unedited going on. It's not clear we'd ever learned what happened in Watergate if he hadn't popped out at a congressional hearing that there was a tape. It may be history will have take till we hear people writing books for money and coming through because we're just going at the edges. And I think we're going to hear a, a, a number of days of a very disappointing testimony about how our United States government works, and it sickens my stomach. And I hope that part of this, that we'll clean it up, and it'll be a lesson to future presidents. Do not let your administration become what this administration became. Yield back. Mr. LaTourette. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, not only for conducting this hearing, but also for granting me the time. And I, I would tell you that although having the opportunity to see you and the distinguished ranking member uh, at a, yet another uh, fundraising investigation right before the millennium uh, is a source of great joy, uh, my uh, excitement is tempered, however. Uh, it is tempered for the reason that uh, have already been spoken about by you, Mr. Waxman, Mr. Souter, Mr. Micah, that precious little has been revealed in these hearings, and I think uh, through no want uh, of trying uh, on, be, uh, on behalf of a number of the members of the committee. And I would suggest that there are a number of reasons for that result. I, I think clearly uh, the fact that there have been so many people who have expressed a strong desire to be a participant in our political process by funneling cash into campaigns, but have been unwilling participants in our judicial system uh, and have fled the long arm of the law and have uh, obfuscated, have stonewalled, have chosen to leave the country, or who have sought refuge under what's certainly permissible, the Fifth Amendment of the Constitution, uh, has made this uh, an exceedingly difficult and in many cases a painful process uh, for people who are interested in finding out what happened in the last election and the election before that. Uh, also, the pace of the investigations and inquiries by the Department of Justice, the choices that they have made at the Department of Justice, the timing, the decisions or the non-decisions, I think has given at least this member the impression that Lady Justice is not only blind, uh, but in some instances deaf and dumb uh, as well. And finally, uh, the conduct of this committee that Mr. Waxman talked about. I, I really think that we have missed a golden opportunity to punish a number of people that deserve to be punished for blatantly, blatantly violating the campaign uh, laws of, of this country. And, and I don't think it's confined to either side. I, you know, I listened intently to Mr. Waxman, and apparently Republicans and, and the Republicans on this committee are bad guys and gals because of what we have done over the last three or four years. Uh, but I will tell you that there are some uh, on this side that want to get the president at all costs. Well, that's stupid. Uh, likewise, there are people on his side of the aisle that want to protect the president at all costs. That's likewise as stupid. The purpose of this investigation is to follow the money. And if the money goes to the President of the United States, then he and everybody in his wake should, have be, should be punished. Likewise, if it stops at a certain level, it stops at a certain level. And I think today's hearing is a perfect example, with all due respect to the distinguished ranking member, of, of how our, our priorities are, are misguided. Uh, I think that we have a witness before us today uh, who, although a number of things have been said about him, regardless of, of whether he's a good guy, bad guy, the fact of the matter is he has pleaded guilty to, uh, I believe, uh, about a million seven in conduit uh, contributions improperly made to uh, political campaigns in this country. He has a great deal of information from reviewing his FBI's testimony uh, about the enlightened way that the Democratic National Committee has raised money from non-citizens in the last election. Uh, it's my understanding that rather than having a hearing uh, where we could ask laser-like questions wherein the answers would be illuminating to not only the United States Congress, but also the people in this country. Instead, we're going to have four days of a faux deposition uh, of Mr. Wong, creating great expense uh, and inconvenience to not only him, uh, but to the committee, when this could have been handled uh, by a briefing by the competent staff uh, of both members. And then, quite frankly, Mr. Waxman, I'll be glad to yield to you. You made it sound as if uh, our, our staff, your staff and the majority staff, take these folks into a room with a bare light bulb and a rubber hose and, and beat the snot out of them. That isn't the way this thing happens. Uh, the fact of the matter is that the lawyers that work for you and work for Mr. Burton and the majority are competent, professional people who I, I think have done the, the best that they can. And I, since I've used your name, I'll be happy to yield to you. I thank you very much for the courtesy of yielding to you. Let me tell you how the rules were changed in the depositions. The rules were changed. It used to be the Republican side would ask questions of a witness in a deposition for a half hour. 
then the Democrats would have a half hour, then the Republicans a half hour. Well, the rules were changed, and the rules said the Democrats have to sit there however long it may take until the Republicans ask every question they might possibly want to ask. That amounted to hours. And then if we had time, Democrats were permitted to ask questions. Questions were asked to witnesses that were absolutely improper about their drug use, their personal lives, had nothing to do with campaign finance issues. They objected, we objected, and then the chairman said, well, the witness had to answer the question. A witness under those circumstances had to take his or her chance that this committee wouldn't hold them in contempt to Congress. It was just far easier to answer whatever questions were asked. People were abused, and again, 161 people went in for depositions. Only 15 ever came before the committee and had something worthwhile to say in open hearings. I think the American people, if, they really, if you really want to let them know the truth, let's have these questions asked in public. And if they're abusive questions, let the public see that abusive questions are being asked. I, I think. I, I you thank you. And if I could take back my time, just because I only get five minutes, unlike the the, the other uh, distinguished members of the committee that are ranking and chairman, I, I I just want to indicate that there are 161 people went in. They all came out, to my knowledge. None of them are missing in action, and, and all of them have survived. It's also my understanding that the, the Democratic side may not have used their time in the travel office investigation to ask questions. And, and lastly, I think the point I'm trying to make is we should be able to do better than that uh, on, on both sides of the aisle. And, and the last thing I want to say, Mr. Chairman, is that the notion, which has already come up, and I think will come up rather early in the witness's uh, written statement as I reviewed it, is that somehow the notion that investigating individuals who improperly channel conduit contributions illegally to political campaigns in this country is responsible for hate crimes in this country is horse dung. Uh, and I thank you very much, and I yield back my time. Mr. Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding these hearings. And Mr. Wong, it's good to have you here. Um, we've had 121 witnesses who have failed to cooperate with the committee based on a number of reasons. They fled the country, uh, they just simply didn't answer questions, and we didn't want to pull them before the committee. And the vast majority used their Fifth Amendment rights uh, not to uh, have uh, self-incriminating testimony. Um, that was 122. Uh, now we can say we have 121 who failing to cooperate, because it's you're here, and I think we'll learn a lot. We'll learn a lot about a corrupt campaign system, um, and we'll also learn about how people became corrupt using that system, and that'll be helpful. Uh, it'll be helpful to hold people accountable if we can, but it'll also be important to hold people accountable for changing a system that is corrupt. Um, I think you may have brought it to a ar new art form. I don't consider you a minor player here. Uh, you were in the DNC and you worked uh, um, in commerce, and commerce became a polluted government agency. Uh, used in many ways to raise money instead of uh, do its job for the American people. Um, bottom line, it's been against the law since 1907 for corporate treasury money to be used in campaigns. It's been against the law since 1947 for union dues money to be used in campaigns. It's been against the law since 1974 for uh, foreign governments to contribute to campaigns. And it's been against law since God knows when for people to use federal buildings uh, to raise money. All four happened uh, under the protection of it being called soft money, the unlimited sums from corporations, labor unions, foreign governments, and individuals. And uh, I hope in the process of holding you and others accountable that we wake up and change this corrupt campaign system. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you again for holding these hearings. Uh, uh, it hasn't been easy for you to do this, and I appreciate that you've persevered. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sauter. May I have unanimous consent to say something? I don't believe Mr. Waxman objected. I'd be happy to have you have me use the balance of my time if you'd like. Yeah. I, I think I'm happy it's... to yield to the gentleman. Thank, I thank the gentleman of Connecticut. The, um, I think it's important for the record to show, and I think most of us here would agree with this, that often we'll get off into arcane questions about whether money, uh, why the corporations can't give money. But the reason for the law is the American government and people were concerned that decisions could be compromised by having uh, money uh, conduits moving uh, in either unforeseen or in large sums. 
And that's why we have the campaign laws. This isn't just some kind of technicality, and it applies to both parties. And, and I know the gentleman from Connecticut has been a leader and is concerned with this, and that's really what we're out here. We're not out to catch somebody because we want to get them. What we're really concerned about is, okay, we saw the illegalities, and what did they impact in our government? And that's why we have to have those laws. I yield back the balance. My chairman yields back the balance this time. Mr. Wong, would you stand and be sworn? Sure. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth shall be God? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Be seated. Mr. Chairman, should I proceed my statement, please? Yes, Mr. Wong, you can proceed with your opening statement. Mr. Chairman, Congressman Waxman, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to appear and address whatever issues may be of interest to you and the American people. I've long hoped for this opportunity. Indeed, as you are aware, in 1997, I offered to testify at the commencement of the Senate hearings chaired by Senator Thompson. At that time, neither the Senate nor the Department of Justice were willing to immunize my testimony as to political fundraising for which I subsequently received probation. As the Department of Justice subsequently has acknowledged, I'm not and never was a spy. I was honored to serve this fine nation and took my Department of Commerce duty as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for International Economic Policy very seriously. I also took my role at the Democratic National Committee very seriously. In addition, while things might have gone easier for me, were I able to implicate the president or vice president in wrongdoing, I never had a base upon which to do so. In fact, I maintain very high regard for each of these dedicated men. The past three years have been a terrible ordeal for me and my family and for many Asian Americans. While there are legitimate and substantive issues that merit inquiry, such as campaign finance reform and ensuring effective access to the political process for minority groups, the focus instead has been on the national origin of individuals like myself and attempts to tar public servants that I, like other Americans, believe in and have served. People seeking publicity have lied about me repeatedly in the press and even before this committee without consequence. For example, a former member of this body, Mr. Sullivan, in attacking the administration, accused me of economic espionage on the basis of what I am advised was an anonymous source at a cocktail party whom, it, if it turned out, did not even mention my name or do anything other than perpetrate a rumor against an unidentified Asian American, a rumor which Mr. Solomon was only too eager to embrace and capitalize upon. It is my hope that in the hearings this week, the questioning will be substantive rather than merely accusatory, purposeful, and of assistance to the American people to the extent it contributes to the accountability of those who both raised and received funds. As for myself, I have made mistakes. Embarrassed and saddened though I am by the unfortunate attention my conduct and notoriety brought upon my community, the dated and isolated offenses which I have openly acknowledged would not deter me from my career-long efforts to promote understanding between the citizens of the United States and those of China, Taiwan, and the rest of Asia. While the United States is a participatory democracy, too few of its citizens participate. And many groups are without sufficient resources to ensure the fair and dispassionate consideration of their views, needs, and concerns. Indeed, as the Department of Justice has concluded, my motivation was not personal gain, but was instead the integration of Asian Americans into the political process of their chosen country. This, of course, is merely an explanation and by no means excuses my conduct, which unfortunately remain largely misunderstood, except by the Department of Justice and the court. I, along with my devoted wife and two sons, were deeply moved by the fact that after almost three years of investigation by the Department of Justice and based upon the nature of the offenses and my extensive, truthful, and complete cooperation, United States District Judge Richard Paez, after a thorough review of all relevant facts, granted me probation. He did so in conformity with the recommendation of the prosecutors who assured him 
of the genuine nature of my remorse. In addition, based upon weeks of interrog interrogation of an army of law enforcement agents and the staffs of independent counsel offices, the Department of Justice advised the court at my sentencing that it considered me a man of a good character and selfless honesty. Moreover, the Department of Justice not only publicly acknowledged my fitness to vote and wrote in support of restoration of my right to do so, it also commended me to the court as an individual uniquely qualified to serve Asian Americans and this great country by building on my demonstrable successes in weaving the Asian community into the intellectual and political fabric of our collective society. The court agreed. I'm grateful for their confidence and for the opportunity for continued public service within my community. Not only am I deeply appreciative of the opportunity provided by Judge Paez for the community service, but after enduring years of scurrilous, ill-motivated, and false allegations, I'm eager to proceed both with this service and my life. Those who know me well have honored me with their continued respect and support. Some who view me only as a means to a questionable end do both themselves and the nation a disservice and persist in unjustifiably demonize me and other Asian Americans. While I am due criticism and am working at atonement, character assassination alone divorced from legitimate ends degrades not me, but those who promote themselves, not by deeds, but by resorting to demagoguery and vitriol. Americans have nothing to fear from me, but they do have much to fear from within. Hate mongers, bigots, and regrettably, even some of our elected officials continue to tear at America's greatest strength, its diversity, and at an alarming and escalating pace. The politics of the pitting religious, ethnic, and racial groups against one another threaten to harm this great country at its foundation, as evidenced by the recent and unbearable series of hate crimes resulting in the death or injury of a Jewish American. African Americans and Asian Americans in Los Angeles, Chicago, and Bloomington, Indiana. Only through the practice of a compassionate, inclusive policy can communities and the nation overcome those who preach fear and exclusion. And while I am by no means a perfect servant, it is to this end I devote my future. In that effort, I'm sustained by my family and friends, those who whose love and support have enabled me to survive this three-year ordeal, during which we have been largely defenseless in the face of an onslaught of unfounded allegations. As a result, and tired as I am after arriving in D.C. this morning following a long day yesterday of cooperation with the Department of Justice in Los Angeles, I'm pleased by this opportunity to assist the committee. I'm looking forward over the next few days to purging that misinformation which currently taints the public's understanding of my efforts over time and to the creation of a credible factual foundation from which the committee, the American people, and I and my family can move forward, ideally with dignity. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Uh, before I start uh, the questioning, I'd like to ask, uh, or make a, you can go ahead and start the clock. So this will be on my time. I'd like to respond just uh, briefly to uh, Mr. Waxman's uh, comments. First of all, regarding the, uh, the new uh, system we have here so that through the Internet the American people can watch the proceedings from gavel to gavel, uh, we're not the first committee to do this. We won't be the last. The International Operations Committee is installing a system like this right now. The Transportation Committee has had one for some time. And we believe that the American people's right to know is extremely important. One of the great strengths of our society is the openness of our government. And uh, uh, to eliminate the doubt about various things that happen in committee hearings, we thought it would be a good idea uh, and a relatively inexpensive idea to make sure that the American people got unvarnished facts from our hearings. And uh, as I said to Mr. Waxman at the outset, we're going to make absolutely sure that there's fairness on both sides. His statement today, which was uh, pretty much an attack on me and the way we've conducted our hearings, uh, the American people saw today unvarnished. And you have a right to say those things. And I, as the chairman of this committee, have a right to uh, refute those if I can. And uh, one of the things I want to say is that uh, 
you made some comments about uh, Mr. Hubble. Uh, I would like to refresh your memory and tell you that uh, after the accusations were made, the next day we released all 16 hours of the Hubble tapes without any change whatsoever. So within 24 hours of the accusations, all Hubble tapes were released to the American press and to the American people. Uh, regarding uh, the, the, the bias that we have and the bias that our government has toward uh, people on the Democrat side and people involved in this campaign finance scandal, Mr. Wong uh, uh, really was not fined any financial penalty whatsoever. Although Mr. Wong and Mr. Tree uh, were involved in over $2 million, we believe, in illegal conduit contributions that came from foreign sources. And much of this money, probably 90% of it, has been res returned. So they were directly involved, and there's no question about it, or else the DNC would not have returned that. While at the same time, uh, the dole for President Committee got $120,000, much less than the $2 million, from uh, uh, a man named Simon Fireman. He was fined $6 million. Uh, the Empire Sanitary Landfill, they gave $129,000. They were fined $8 million. Uh, another Republican who was responsible for much fewer illegal conduit contributions than Mr. Wong had a $5 million fine. And uh, both of the Republicans got uh, terms of detention. Now, none of that has happened to any of the Democrat uh, conduit contributors that we know of. $5 million fine, $8 million fine. A six million dollar fine and so as far as the equal application of justice doesn't appear to me that there has been an equal application of justice by this uh, justice department and i've talked about that a number of times and i've said that i thought the attorney general was showing a bias was blocking our investigations wasn't a cooperating with this committee and i said the same things of the white house now i stand by what i've said in the past i understand and much of what you said today mr waxman you have said time and time again, you tried to make a comedy out of our hearings. You tried to denigrate our hearings. You tried to say we've been on a witch hunt. You tried to say all kinds of things. And you said it again today. And you have a right to say those things. But the fact of the matter is, we are determined, if it's at all possible, to get to the bottom of this campaign finance scandal. And we're going to be vigilant and we're going to continue. And I fully expect at future hearings, you will say the same things over and over again. You will attack me over and over again, but I want you to know, Mr. Waxman, I and this committee will not be deterred, and now the American people can watch gavel to gavel and judge for themselves from the questions and answers of the witnesses whether or not we're being fair. And I think that they're going to be pretty fair when they judge what we do. Now, let me start with the questions, uh, Mr. Wong. When was the last time that you spoke to James Riotti? I think around May or June this year. May or June of this year? Yes, sir. And uh, when was the last time you spoke to Mokhtar Riotti? It's around the same time, sir. About the same time? Yes, sir. Was that on a long distance call or was that in person? No, I was, I was visiting uh, Jakarta. You were in Jakarta? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you speak to any other individuals from the Lippo group at that time? There were some Lippo employees at that time, and because there was a Mr. Riotti, Mr. Mokhtar Riotti, is 70 years of birthday, I was invited to attend. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, how much were you in contact with James Riotti during 1997 and 1998? I'm sorry, sir. Uh, how much were you in contact? How many times or do you recall? Were you in contact with him a lot during 97? No, it's only one occasion. I've, I traveled to Asia in 1987. 1997, 1997, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I did visit in uh, around August in 1980, uh, 1997. I had an occasion to, to meet with Mr. Riyadi in Singapore. And in 1998? That was 1990, That was 1998, I'm sorry. 1999, this year, as I, I went to Jakarta. Do you know, uh, do you recall the substance of the communications you had with Mr. Riotti during those visits? Okay, in 1998, that was the first meeting I had uh, after all these campaign finance matter erupted. So for the last previous few years, I never had opportunity. Apparently, he read of a lot of articles, and 
news account, watching our TVs, he expressed some concern to see how I could hold on on, on this matter. So more or less is a concerning about me. Uh, did you talk to them on the telephone in addition to those meetings? Uh, there was a couple phone calls, like at Christmas time, the New Year, they're just saying uh, Happy New Year. That's about all. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me correct my statement. I added a little points in. Both of my trips went to Asia in 1998 and 1999 were approved by the Department of Justice. Okay. Did you uh, receive any money from the Riotti family since uh, September of 1996? Yes, I did. Uh, some gift money. Some gift money? A gift money, yes. H how much money was that? Uh, the first time in, I believe is in, this, in the Christmas time around 1997, was around 18,000. Uh, the second time during the, uh, the trips in 1998, I received 20,000. So you received 18,000 in 1997 and 20,000 in 1998. Uh, and you say that was a Christmas gift? No, it was a gift money. What was it given for? As a, as a gift, because I, I, I have not been working for all these years. You know, as a, as a, as a friend, so probably he was just showing a concern about me. Now, th this was during the height of our campaign finance investigation that, that, that they gave you these uh, gifts. I think the, the, the investigation was still going on, yes. Yeah. I don't know what's the height or not, sir. Were there any stipulations, or did they just give these to you because uh, they felt like you needed the money? There's no stipulation, mm -hmm. no. Have you gotten any more money uh, since the $20,000 you received in 1999? Uh, as I indicated, I made a trip uh, in 1999 this year. There was uh, just a few thousand dollars cover my travel expenses. So they paid your travel expenses over there and back? That's right. But in addition to the 18000 in 1997 and, 19, and 20000 in 98, you have received, or 98 and 99, you have received uh, no other funds? No, sir. Hmm. Have you uh, read any of the campaign finance depositions? About myself or about... The others. Uh, uh, have you read any of the campaign finance depositions of yourself or anyone else? I did not. Are you aware of any of the statements from any of the witnesses uh, regarding the campaign finance investigation? I do not. No. Have you watched any of the campaign finance hearings or read any of the transcripts from any of our hearings? Have you had an opportunity to do that? With all due respect, I, I don't have a cable. I, I really did not have a chance to do So that. you haven't heard or read anything of the statements of the witnesses? No, I read on newspaper occasionally, but I don't even subscribe regularly on newspaper on that, sir. Have you had any contact with Charlie Tree since the investigation began? Yes, in one of the two occasions, very briefly, uh, because her, his wife was very ill, uh, I, th I believe was suffering cancer while I was uh, traveling to Asia, and the people told me uh, about his wife's situation. I expressed a concern, so I called him, mm -hmm. just to ex express my sympathy on that. But that's the only contact during the investigation? That's only the contact, sir. How about Maria Shah? Uh, she did call my home before my, my wife answered the phone, but I did not really speak directly to her. And when was this? This was, I believe, the one time in this year. Now, there was some one occasion at the beginning of the investigation, right after the 96 matters came out. Mm -hmm. There were some conversations. Uh, it was not really a detail. Uh, that was a little bit, few more minutes. You know, it's a little bit longer conversation. Did, it did, it did the conversation relate in any way to the campaign finance uh, uh, problems or investigation? If I remember vaguely, there's trying to identify whether there's a copy copy of a check which uh, uh, some of the, her contributors have made, whether I have a copy for that or not. She wanted to know if you had a copy of the check. A, po a copy of the check. Right. Did, did you have a copy? Why well, was this still in the DNC, though, sir? You were still at the DNC? Yeah. But afterwards, I remember there was also one conversation. But I could not recall very, very extensive what the, the detail was about. Have you talked to Pauline Kinchanilak? Not with her at all. And Ted Seong or uh, his family? Uh, I had only one meeting with the Ted Shones at the beginning, I believe it was in 1996. Uh, 
why my, why, when my matter erupts, his matter was not coming out yet. Uh, you said when you talked to Mr. Riotti, uh, he said, uh, how could you hold on or... Uh, no, he was trying to see how I, hold, I had hold, held on. How, how are you holding up? Is that that's what he right, meant? That's right, that's right. So he wasn't asking any question about would you, whether you could keep quiet about something? Oh, no. Okay. Not in that nature, sir. All right. Did uh, James Riotti fly from Indonesia to the U.S. to attend a fundraiser with Governor Clinton on August 14, 1992 in California? It's, I think 1986 you're talking about, right? No, I'm talking about 1992. James Riotti, did he fly from Indonesia to the U.S. to attend a fundraiser for Governor Clinton in California on August 14, 1992? Yes, he did. Uh, James Riotti entered the country with $24,400 in cash. Do you remember what he did with that money? That I don't know. You do not know? I do not know with the cash, no. Exhibit 15, and do we have that to put up? Or is it in the book? I think you have a book, uh, Exhibit 15, if you could refer to that. It's an August 12, 1992 memo from Melinda Yee to Annette Castro providing information about Mr. Riotti so he could attend an Asian Pacific American roundtable discussion. Uh, do you recall if James Riotti attended the APA roundtable discussion on August the 12th, 1992? I do not recall there was any roundtable discussion in August of 1992, though. You don't recall being at a meeting like that on August the 12th? No, there was, no, there was only the fundraising event on August 6th, okay. 1992. So you don't recall James Riotti being at that meeting? I don't even know there was such a round table. Okay. Yes. On Exhibit 17, there's a memo from Melinda Yee to uh, Governor Clinton. It has talking points for Governor Clinton for the August 14, 1992 fundraiser. Uh, at the top, it says the event is hosted by Fong Yu and John Wong. Did you host that uh, fundraiser along with uh, Fong Yu? I hope the date of the memo is correct. We did have a fundraising event I was hosting was March Fong Yu uh, in honor of the then Governor Clinton. Mm -hmm. Kennedy Clinton at that time in San Gabriel, California. That was a luncheon, fundraising. And how did you become the host or co-host of that event? I was very much involved in the community affairs and also, you know, I was helping out the political causes before. That was with the Asian Pacific American Organization? Yeah, called Pacific Leadership, so in, in okay. specifically. Did you uh, pledge to raise or contribute a certain amount of money to become the host of that hearing or that meeting? In, essentially, yes. It's about $100,000. You pledged to raise $100,000? That's correct. Exhibit 18 is a schedule for Governor Clinton for the August 14, 1992 fundraiser. That's Exhibit 18. Yes. Did... Uh, Mr. Riotti, in fact, uh, greet Governor Clinton uh, at the elevator prior to that event? Uh, with the other, other people as well, like the, uh, Madame March Fong Yu, the other community leaders at the same time. So there was a group of people that There's met him a group there. Of people So there was elevator. nothing specific about the Riotti meeting with him at that point? No, sir. Yeah. Okay. Were there any discussions at that elevator or anything of uh, substance or just a greeting? Well, just a greeting and then the uh, Governor Clinton was escorted to the, uh, the main dining room. Okay. Uh, on uh, Exhibit 19, if you could turn to that, is a memo from Melinda Yee to Governor Clinton regarding a limousine ride that Mr. Riotti was supposed to take with Governor Clinton on August the 14th. Uh, 
where did Melinda Yee get that information about the limousine ride that was to take place with the then Governor Clinton? Okay. May I read this first, please, sir? Sure. Uh, that was uh, through the, uh, the request of Mr. James Rowdy, through me. So uh, you were requested by James Rowdy to set up a limousine ride where he could talk to Governor Clinton That's correct. privately. That's correct. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I might have made a mistake on the date. If that August 14 is similar to the date I was thinking about the fundraising event, then August 14 probably was the correct day, sir. Okay. Uh, how much did uh, the Riottis give for that event on August the 14th? Do you recall? Well, as, we, as I mentioned to you, I have committed for $100,000. That's about all I did. Uh, the Riottis gave 90000 of that. Is that correct? With all the companies all to get us approximately that amount, yes. So it was from the Riotti group? The group, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, why did Mrs. Yi say that the Riottis gave $100,000 when they gave ninety? I believe probably the other 10,000 is coming from me and my wife. Yeah. So your wife gave uh, $10,000. Was that her own money? Myself and, and my, my wife. That was your own personal funds? At that time, it was. Yes. Would Melinda Yee have thought that this $10,000 was going to be coming ultimately from the Riottis through you? No. No, sir. Since Mr. Riotti was not a U.S. citizen and since uh, he then permanently resided in Indonesia, did anyone express to him any concerns that it was illegal for him to contribute money to, the, to a U.S. political campaign? No, so if I, be, if I remember correctly, Mr. Riotti at that time still had the green card status, sir. Was he living in the United States? No, he was traveling back to Indonesia, but he still had the green card status. He maintained a home in the United States. At but he time. was living in Indonesia. Uh, he spent a lot of time over there at that time, yes. How did Melinda Yee know that James Riotti had the potential to give much more? That's a quotation she used. I can't speculate. It Maybe just out of impression uh, she had on the group, the size of the group, you know, the, the business that he, the Riotti family had. Did, did, did you indicate in any way to her that the Riottis were capable and willing to give much more? If I did give that impression, and, and I don't remember at this time, uh, Mr. Chairman. Was uh, Melinda Yee aware, to your knowledge, that uh, Mr. Riotti was going to give much more by funneling it through his companies and employees? The detailed parts, no. Not uh, how the money is going to be funneled was not known to any of the other people, uh, Mr. Chairman. Well, did, before, the, before the limousine ride took place, did you know that Mr. Riotti was going to uh, tell the then Governor Clinton that he was going to raise a million dollars uh, for him? I did not know. Until after the ride. But however, I do know a fact that, that he did indicate if he really want to give something out, to give more instead of less. I'm not sure I understand. He's, he, he would give less because he was concerned. In other words, you give a large amount of work to have a greater impact that way. I see. Apart from the in information in uh, Mrs. Yee's memo, did Governor Clinton have any other information to believe that James Riotti lived in Indonesia at the time? I mean, he knew he flew in from Indonesia to meet at this uh, fundraiser. Did he know, aside from flying in for the fundraiser, that uh, uh, he was living in Indonesia? No, I don't know what Mr. Clinton knows about that. But I suspect Mr. Clinton would know because the Lippo group is quite extensive. They have a position in different parts of the world. Uh, if you could look at Exhibit 20 now, it's a chart of LIPO-related contributions that were given prior to, before, uh, the August 14th, uh, 1992 fundraiser. Were David Ye's uh, contributions given for the August 14th, 1992 fundraiser? 
I could not really tie that into it at this point. It could be, could be at this time. So. Are all of these contributions that you see uh, illegal? And if not, can you identify the ones that are legal and explain why they're legal? I'm not a lawyer so at this time to judge about that, whether they're, they're legal or not, uh, on, the, on the surface on that. Well, as you can see, you've got David Ye, you've got uh, Jane Wong, uh, you've got Hip Hing Holdings and the Riottis, uh, both James and Eileen. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yeah, let me consult with my lawyer a little bit. So. Sure. At that particular moment, Mr. David Ye has a green card holder. At that time, I believe he was legal. Legally, could uh, he could legally give? For instance, uh, my wife's a certain American citizen. She could give. And the Hipping Holding was a U.S. entity at that time, and also had the U.S. revenue. And uh, I believe at that time uh, they could get. James Riotti and Lee Riotti had green card holders, so at that time I believe they could get. But later on, when things developed, and some of the money, I believe, probably they were somehow being reimbursed or taken care of. They were being reimbursed from the uh, Lippo Group in Indonesia? Except the Riyadi's uh, money, which I, I certainly have no doubt that they were being reimbursed. They are very rich themselves already. I understand, but right. uh, the others there, uh, you, uh, your wife, David Ye, uh, and the others, uh, were, to your knowledge, were they reimbursed by the uh, Lippo Group in Indonesia? I did not check for sure, but I believe they were probably been taken care of like Mr. David Ye. Okay. Uh, in Indonesia? No, he was not in Indonesia, but he was in Hong Kong, Mr. Mr. David Ye. I know, but he, the, the money was coming from over there and, and he was yeah, being it could reimbursed. Be, could be from there, yes. yes. Who is David Ye? Mr. David Ye was the, uh, the president of the Lippo Bank California, and later on was transferred to Hong Kong as the managing director of uh, one of the group company handled real estate in Hong Kong. Where was he living at the time? At the time, well, I believe he was just being transferred to Hong Kong. Then. So he was living in Hong Kong? Yes, sir. Uh, was David Ye, well, you said you believe he probably was reimbursed for his contributions. I don't know for sure. I the reason I speculate in there because uh, the matter related to me, I was taken care of. I believe some of the executives who made a contribution are also being taken care of. Now, were you and your wife reimbursed for that $10,000 uh, uh, that you contributed uh, through your bonus in 1992? Yes, sir. And that was from the Lippo Group in uh, Indonesia? Yes, from the from Lippo entity somewhere. Who was the DNC or Clinton Gore contact for these contributions? In 1992, I believe, was Mary Leslie. Mary Leslie? Yes. Uh, can you look at Exhibit 21 now? It's a uh, DNC donor card for James Riotti's $5,000 contribution to the California Democrat Party on August the 13th, 1992. Uh, do you know who filled out that donor card for Mr. Riotti? Do you know who's, who, who filled that out? The donor card's handwriting, I don't know. That was uh, not your writing? That was not my handwriting. Did it anyone... It does, did, excuse me, it does not appear to be a Mr. Riotti's handwriting either. Did anyone tell Mr. Riotti to put Lippo Bank U.S. as his business address, even though he lived in Indonesia? I don't know. I don't know what happened there. Apparently, people might have the impression that he was, uh, he was uh, over there. Now, the Hip Hing Holdings $50,000 contributions for uh, August 14, 1992, if you could look at Exhibit 22, uh, there's a, it's an August 17, 1992 memo from you, and uh, Igus uh, Setiawan, I hope I pronounced that correctly, to Mrs. Ong Bui, or B, uh, Ng. Did you request the $50,000 HIP uh, Hing Holdings contributions to be reimbursed? The memo has my name, but I believe that was sent by Mr. August, August Setiawan. 
When I did he, are you saying that he, he asked that the uh, hip hang holdings contribution be reimbursed? That item was the list there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, let me explain to you routinely on a very regular basis, whatever expenses incurred in hipping holdings, uh, the control of the company, meaning the Agu Setiawan, all my colleagues at that time, would send the report back to Indonesia to indicating how much was spent during that period of time. And then we would request for re replenishment of the money coming back. So even though your, your name is on there, uh, you're saying that uh, Mr. Seti Awan uh, is the one who initiated that? Mr. Chairman, by no means I should shirk my responsibility on this part because my name was there. And also I was more or less a senior position in that uh, operation. So I take responsibility on that part, sir. A Exhibit 23, if you can take a look at that. It's a wire transfer from the Lippo Bank Limited to Hip Hing Holdings. Uh, where is Lippo Bank Limited located? It's, it's not really readable on my copy, a copy here. Um, okay, well, where is Lippo Bank Limited located? That was located in Jakarta, in Jakarta. Uh, Indonesia. Now, that, does that $146,500 wire from Lippo Bank Limited to Hip Hing Holdings on August 24th, does that include reimbursement for the $50,000 Hip Hing Holdings contribution? Yes, it is. It does. Were you and Mr. Setiawan aware that it was illegal to reimburse a political contribution? At that time, probably it's totally, I did not really think about that issues. At that moment, at that moment. You, you did not know it was illegal at that time? Did not. Did not think of this was done. How many times prior to the limousine ride uh, did you or James Riotti speak to Governor Clinton uh, in August of 1992? I don't believe in that year Mr. Riotti had ever spoken to uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clinton then. But I did have one or two occasions because during the campaign trail, I met with uh, then Governor Clinton. One time, I believe it's in February, the other time probably in March. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I also had arranged a get-together session for him to meet with uh, some Chinese American or Asian American community leaders in Chinatown, Los Angeles in April. In April of that year? In that year, yes. Was the purpose of the limousine ride solely so Mr. Riotti could tell Governor Clinton about his plan to raise a million dollars for his campaign? I don't know that was originally intention for him to tell Mr. Clinton personally on that now. But there was the occasion for, because there was a long time since they both met uh, after Mr. Mr. Riotti left Little Rock, Arkansas. So it more or less just uh, get a acquaintance uh, on that as issues. Do you know if Mr. Riotti wanted to discuss banking issues or international business with Governor Clinton during that uh, ride in the limousine? I didn't think those issues came about, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. The ride was very, very short because virtually from point of the restaurant in St. Gabriel, go to another uh, location in same town in St. Gabriel, probably no more than five minutes or 10 minutes ride, sir. Why would, why would Mr. Riotti want to give a million dollars to then Governor Clinton's campaign for the president? That's, that's quite a bit of money. I know they're very wealthy people, but why would they want to give a million dollars? Wouldn't they, would they expect anything in return for that or did they want, well, what did they want for that? I, I really could not really speak, uh, speak of Mr. Riotti's mind. By if you want me speculating, I can do that. Go ahead. Uh, as I indicated to you earlier, you know, if we really want to contribute, if it contributes ten thousand dollars is his contribution, but may not create a bigger impact. If you really want to make an impact, you want to make a very large amount of contribution. So I understand. Even, better impression that way. Yeah. Okay, but if you want to make an impact, for what reason do you want to make the impact? No, people would notice of you, you know, on that basis. They would notice of you so you would have influence and be able to get things done, is that correct? You, you get attention, more or less, I think. From whom? From the candidate or from campaigning other people. You know, you have a different status. 
No, no, the larger donors definitely have the better status. That so way. they have more access. That's correct. Okay. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You started off your half hour uh, time period asking questions by reacting to some of the criticisms that you heard in my opening statement. And I want to point out that uh, if you read the statement over carefully, you'll find the harshest of the comments were not mine, but pr attributed to reputable news sources and even Republican staff people and, and members. And I also want people who may be watching this uh, hearing to know that notwithstanding the fact the chairman said we're going to have free and open coverage of what goes on in today's hearings, uh, there's C-SPAN coverage, gavel to gavel, complete. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a sense, there's a redundancy to have the committee control its own gavel to gavel coverage. I just want to point out that we have two different media coverage gavel to gavel, so everyone can see everything that's said at this hearing. But what the American people won't see is what's not called before the members of this committee. Serious campaign finance violations and allegations of violations that have been ignored by this committee. The chairman alone has issued subpoenas, so members on our side have asked him to pursue an investigation into various allegations that have come up over the last several years about serious Republican fundraising abuses. For example, there is a, uh, there is a Republican National Committee Chairman, Haley Barber, uh, worked with a group uh, called the National Policy Forum. And he got millions of dollars into this National Policy Forum from a non-citizen in Hong Kong named Ambrose Young. And then he used that money to help Republicans. It appears, from what I've heard of it, to be illegal. We asked that it be investigated, and it wasn't. There's a group called the Triad Management Services. This is a group that advised Republicans on how to launder campaign money and avoid the limits under the law. Uh, there uh, were allegations as well about uh, Republican fundraising on federal property. For example, there was a Republican Party to come and meet Senator Dole when he was a senator for $15,000 in the Senate caucus room, or for $45,000, they could have met and had lunch with then Speaker Newt Gingrich. And um, we'll go into it again now and then later. The most serious of the allegations is the one made by a fellow named Peter Claren, who said that he was asked by Minority majority whip Tom DeLay to make a conduit contribution to a Republican House candidate. Here's the fellow who made the contributions, chairman, to even respond to a letter of the Democrats to investigate it. We asked at one time that this committee, in looking at campaign finance violations, try to find out why the Republican leadership in 1997 wanted to give a $50 billion tax break to the tobacco industry. And of course, it followed uh, the Republican National Committee receiving $8.8 .8 million from the tobacco industry. So the, you, you who are watching this hearing will see what goes on today. But what you won't see is what the chairman doesn't want you to know about. And those are serious violations by Republicans. That's why this whole investigation is not credible. I'm not saying there have not been serious violations of the campaign laws by Democrats and by Mr. Wong. But if this were a legitimate investigation, we wouldn't be uh, so limited in uh, our uh, ability today to present, or, or not just today, at any other time, uh, to um, get to the bottom of things, to get the facts wherever they may lead us. Now, Mr. Wong, um, you've admitted that from 1992 to 1994, while working for the Lippo Group, headquartered in Indonesia, you took part in a scheme to make illegal conduit con campaign contributions. These are serious offenses. They are felonies. And you pled guilty to a felony violation of the campaign finance laws for making these conduit contributions. No one should minimize these uh, or tolerate these violations. They're serious 
and deserve punishment. Do you agree with that? Yes, I do, Mr. Waxman. These are the kinds of things that, unfortunately, have happened too much in the abuses of our campaign laws. Uh, Congressman Shays, who's a member of the subcommittee, introduced a bill which I supported to try to plug up the complete abuse of the campaign finance system. The reality is that all those limits and restrictions, whether it be from corporate contributions or labor union money or, uh, or uh, all these phony organizations that are set up to receive the money and then spend more than individual candidates could spend, these are toler tolerated now and acceptable and have become par for the course. I, I think what you did, Mr. Wong, was scandalous. But I think what's being done every single campaign, and now this coming year will probably be done in a greater magnitude than what we saw even in 1996 and 1998, is just quite scandalous and needs to be repaired. You aren't the central figure in the allegations of campaign finance abuse during the 1996 presidential election because of conduit contributions. That's what you pleaded guilty to. My staff has done a LexisNexis search of media reports that mention your name. Since October of 1996, there have been over 7,000 articles that mention your name in newspapers around the country. The reason you have been the center of so much attention is that Republicans in Congress have, have, re, have um, uh, repeatedly alleged that you were part of a Chinese conspiracy to influence the U.S. elections, that you gave national secrets to the Chinese, that you were part of a scheme involving President Clinton and the DNC to knowingly solicit illegal foreign campaign contributions. We've even, even heard some of these allegations and innuendo in the opening statements of some of my colleagues today. These allegations of conspiracy and espionage are extraordinarily serious, extraordinarily serious. And I voted for immunity so that you would testify today because I want to learn whether they are true and to find out what really did and did not happen during the 1996 presidential election. And my approach to questioning you is different than the chairman's. The chairman has sched scheduled your testimony for four days of hearings because he wants to conduct this hearing like a deposition. He apparently wants to ask you about virtually everything that you've done since 1992. In fact, I was told that he has over 100 pages of questions that he's intending to ask you. He's told us to be ready to meet here till late tonight, tomorrow, the next day, maybe the day after. Three years ago, when we began this investigation, that might have been appropriate. It might have made some sense. But today, we know what the central issues are, and those aren't what uh, those are what we should be asking you about. So I'm going to ask you about the major allegations that have been made in this investigation. Let's get the, those statements on the record. You're under oath. You're yes, testifying sir. before us under a grant of immunity. So tell you can tell us the truth without fear of prosecution, and you're under oath, and if you don't tell us the truth, you'll be guilty of perjury. Mr. Wong, do you have any knowledge that would implicate the President of the United States in any illegal activity? No, Mr. Waxman. Do you have any knowledge that would implicate the Vice President of the United States in any illegal activity? No, Mr. Waxman. Do you have any knowledge that would implicate the First Lady in any illegal activity? No, Mr. Waxman. Do you have any knowledge that would implicate the Democratic National Committee in any illegal activity? No, Mr. Marshall. One of the first allegations made about your conduct was made by former House Speaker Newt Gingrich in the Wall Street Journal in October 1996. According to Speaker Gingrich, the Riyadi contribution which you arranged, quote, makes Watergate look trivial, end quote. He went on to allege that, quote, we have never in American history had an American president selling pieces of this country to foreigners, end quote. In essence, Speaker Gingrich was alleging that President Clinton was selling U.S. foreign policy in exchange for campaign contributions that you helped to arrange. That's treason. Is it true? Were you involved in a scheme to buy favorable policy decision, decisions for foreigners with campaign contributions? No, sir. Did you ever have any conversation with the president or any of his advisors 
in which the president or his advisors discuss making a policy decision in order to benefit campaign contrib contributors? No, sir. Are you aware of any evidence of any kind that supports Spinger, Speaker Gingrich's allegation that the president was selling pieces of this country to foreigners? No, sir. One of the major allegations that's been made is that you were part of a conspiracy involving Johnny, uh, Charlie Tree and John Chung to funnel illegal campaign contributions from the Chinese government to the president with the president's knowledge. Senator James Inhofe, who's uh, from Oklahoma, was one of the many who made this allegation. And I want to quote what he said on the Senate floor earlier this year. John Wong, Charlie Tree, Johnny Chung, James Riotti, and others with strong ties to China were deeply involved with the president's knowledge in raising Chinese tainted cash for the Clinton campaign, end quote. I want to ask you about the assertions made in this allegation. Were you part of a fundraising conspiracy involving Charlie Tree and Johnny Chung, as Senator Inhofe and others have alleged? No, sir. Were you part of a conspiracy to raise campaign contributions from the Chinese government? No, sir. Do you have any knowledge about any efforts by the Chinese government to make illegal campaign contributions to President Clinton? No, sir. Part of Senator Inhofe's allegation is that President Clinton knew that you and others were raising Chinese tainted cash. Chairman Burton has made similar allegation about the president's knowledge. Is this true? No, sir. Did President Clinton participate in or have any knowledge of efforts to raise illegal foreign campaign contributions as far as you know? No, sir. Did you ever have any discussions with the president about who you were raising campaign contributions from? No, sir. Another major allegation is that you were a Chinese spy. Let's get that on the table. Speaker Gingrich, for example, went on national television in April 1997 to allege that, quote, John Wong was clearly being given secrets while going to the Chinese embassy, end quote. Chairman Burton made a similar accusation on national television in February of 1997 when he said that Mr. Wong may very well have given information that he shouldn't have to the Chinese and others. In fact, when Chairman Burton was asked on national television whether you were a Chinese spy, he alleged, quote, that's a possibility. Let me ask you about this well-publicized -publi possibility. Are you now or were you ever a Chinese spy? No, sir. Have you at any time ever given any classi classified information directly or indirectly to the Chinese government? No, sir. Did anyone ever ask or suggest that you pass classified information or any other information to which they were not entitled to the Chinese government? No, sir. Another accusation is that you weren't, uh, if you weren't a Chinese spy, you were, in effect, a spy for the Lippo Group. Former Congressman Jerry Solomon, who was the chairman of the House Rules Committee and a member of the Republican leadership, repeatedly made this allegation. For example, he alleged on national television in June 1997 that you gave national secrets to the Lippo Group. Specifically, he stated, quote, Mr. Wong was passing on classified information both dealing with economic espionage and breaches of national security to a foreign corporation with connections to the Chinese government, end quote. These allegations made front page news and they were treated very seriously. Are Mr. Solomon's allegations true? No, sir. Are any part of them true? No, sir. When you were at the Department of Commerce, were you an agent of the Lippo Group, as Mr. Solomon has alleged? Uh, Mr. Waxman, would you repeat the question again? When you were at the Department of Commerce, were you an agent of the Lippo Group, as Mr. Solomon has alleged? Oh, I, I missed the agent's name. I'm sorry. I was not. No, definitely not. Well, you, you have immunity. Did you do anything for the Lippo Group no, while you were in no, the Department sir. of Commerce? No. Have you had any time ever given classified, classified information to the Lippo Group? No. Did anyone ever ask you to give classified information to the Riyadis or the Lippo Group? No, sir. Did you ever use your position at the Commerce Department to help the Riyadis or the Lippo Group? No, sir. Another major allegation is that you were illegally laundering campaign contributions while you were employed at the DNC. 
Here's what the chairman said about these activities in September 1997 to the Associated Press. There, quote, there's no question that Mr. Wong did this. This is the first time we have found an active person at the DNC who was involved in money laundering. Mr. Wong, while he was an executive at the DNC in the finance area, was laundering money, and we will be able to prove that. Was Mr. Burton right? Did you launder campaign contributions while at the DNC? No, sir. Mr. Chairman, uh, let me point out that you requested from the Justice Department to provide this committee the notes from a number of FBI interviews. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, may I have your attention? Yes. You, you've asked from the Justice Department to give our committee a number of FBI interviews relating to Mr. Wong and the campaign finance investigation. And I understand the Justice Department agreed to provide these notes that were called 302s mm -hmm. to the committee this afternoon. I think we even received some of them. I would like to request at this time that you also ask the Justice Department to provide the committee with the notes from the FBI interview of, Rep of former Representative Jerry Solomon. Chairman Solomon told the media that he knew of evidence that John Wong uh, committed economic espionage and breached our national security by passing classified information to his former employer, the Lippo Group. I believe the American people have the right to know what evidence was uh, that Mr. Solomon had if there any such evidence actually existed. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to see if you will agree to ask the Just Justice Department to provide Mr. Solomon's 302 along with all the other 302s uh, to this committee this afternoon. I have no problem with that. We'll, we'll request that from the Justice Department. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Wong, you've said that you facilitated a number of conduit contributions between 1992 and June 1994. In some instances, you identified LIPO employees who could legally make contributions and solicited contributions from them with the understanding they would be, quote, taken care of by James Riotti. In other instances, you made the contributions yourself and expected to be reimbursed in your annual bonus. And you also prepared memos to get reimbursements from overseas for corporate contributions made by LIPO's U.S. entities. Uh, this sounds to me like a pretty elaborate plan. Uh, it was blatantly illegal. Didn't you know that this plan was illegal? I knew that was not proper. Uh, I was sorry for that, uh, Mr. Waxman. With the gentleman yelled briefly. Uh, Senator Lieberman uh, indicated in the hearings that were held in the Senate, and I'll quote him directly, he said, non-public evidence presented to the committee demonstrates a continuing business intelligence relationship between the Riotis and the People's Republic of China Intelligence Service. Now that's classified information which we can't bring out in this committee, but I suggest that you and I and uh, the committee probably ought to uh, check with the intelligence agencies to take a look at that because Mr. Lieberman evidently had that information and he's a Democrat senator. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd be happy to join with you in getting that information, but we have Mr. Wong here, and he's under oath, and he's under immunity. What do you say to the chairman's uh, quote from Senator Lieberman? Mr. Chairman, would you read? I'm sorry about this. Mr. Chairman, would you yield? Sure. Uh, Senator Lieberman said, and this is a quote from the Senate hearings, he said, non-public evidence, he's talking about intelligence evidence from FBI or CIA, presented to the committee demonstrates a continuing business intelligence relationship between the Riyadis and the People's Republic of China Intelligence Service. Do you know anything about that? I don't know whether it's the intelligence service or not. But the Riyadi group does have some business partnership with some Chinese corporations in Hong Kong. I don't know if that's what it related or not, but I don't know that entity in Hong Kong or entities in Hong Kong was the, uh, the arm of the Chinese, uh, you know, espionage units or not. At that time, I certainly did not know. At this moment, I don't even know. Uh, and this scheme that you do know about because you engineered, uh, did you at any time question whether it was proper to make these conduit contributions? No, I did not. You, you felt that it might not be proper or legal. Why did you decide to break the law? 
Mr. Waxman, in the human life, sometimes you have to make decisions in a crossroad. And sometimes, you know, you have to make decisions. By not making decisions, it's also a decision. But at that time, I, dis I, was, you know, I made a decision to continue that. And, and uh, I, I certainly regret, you know, that those things happened at the time. Maybe it was the, was the, was the anticipation problems would not, would not be found out, found out. That's usually what people think when they break the law. That is correct, sir. No, I, I definitely regret that. Well, what you did was a serious violation of the law, and I think you owe the American uh, people an Yeah, apology. I do. Uh, I do, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Weichel, uh, Westman. Um, in August of this year, you reached a plea bargain with justice, and I understand that you pleaded guilty to making illegal conduit contributions. According to the Justice Department's announcement of your plea, you were, quote, responsible for arranging approximately $156,000 in the illegal campaign contributions from Lippo Group overseas to various Democratic and Republican political committees between 1992 and June 1994. So I want to ask you about these activities in some detail. I understand that the individuals who were involved in these conduit contributions were primarily James Riotti and other Lippo executives. Is that right? That's correct, sir. Was the DNC aware that these contributions were illegal conduit contributions? No, sir. Was the president or vice president aware that these contributions were illegal conduit contributions? No, sir. In your statement to the FBI, you indicated that James Riotti told you about a limousine ride he took with then Governor Clinton in August 1992, in which Mr. Riotti told Mr. Clinton that he would like to raise $1 million for his presidential campaign. Chairman Burton has said that this conversation proves that the president was a knowing participant in the illegal conduit contribution scheme. Here's what the chairman said on national television on November 2nd of this year. Wong said that James Riotti told the president he would raise a million dollars from foreign sources for his campaign. The president knew James Riotti was doing it. He knew that it was foreign money coming in from the Lippo Group in Jakarta, Indonesia, and he didn't decline it. He accepted it. Is the chairman correct? Did the president know that these contributions were illegal? No, I have no knowledge that the president knows about it. I don't believe the president knew about this. To the best of your knowledge in their conversation, did Mr. Riotti in any way indicate to the president the source of the money that he was going to raise? No, I, I have no indication that way. At the time Mr. Riotti had this conversation with the president, he was a legal permanent resident of the United States. As such, he was legally entitled to make, make campaign contributions or to raise contributions from others. Is that right? That is correct. Let me ask you the bottom line question. Did you ever at any point in time have any conversation with President Clinton where you indicated to him that any foreign or illegal contributions were being made or did he ever indicate to you that he had any knowledge of foreign contributions? No, sir. Mr. Wong, you've been accused of soliciting illegal foreign contributions while working at the DNC in 1996. Let me ask you a series of questions that cover the entire time period that you worked at the DNC as a fundraiser. That was from uh, December 1995 to October 1996. While at the DNC, did you ever knowingly solicit or accept any foreign political contributions? No, sir. While at the DNC, did you ever knowingly assist any foreign government or company to funnel money in any form to, into the U.S. political system? No, sir. Did anyone at the DNC or the White House ever ask you or suggest to you that you solicit illegal contributions of any kind? No, sir. Did you ever talk to the president or the vice president about the source of any political contributions you solicited? No, sir. Did anyone at the DNC know that foreign contributions were being made? No, sir.
Mr. Wong, you're here under oath. You're also here with a vote for immunity, so you cannot be held criminally liable for your, your uh, conduct, except if you lie to us. And if it turns out that you did lie to this committee, well, Mr. Burton and I don't see eye to eye on many things. He and I will be working together to ask that there be a prosecution for perjury against you. I've asked you a series of questions that go to the most serious allegations that have been made against you for the last three years. And I want you to take a moment and reflect on your answers and tell us if there's anything else you think we ought to know about relating to those questions that I asked you. Mr. Waxman, I certainly I don't have any reason to have any knowledge that I answered your question incorrectly at this time, sir. Mr. Waxman, yes. Our side, I don't know what the report was about. I do not have any benefit. You don't have any benefit of no you have the benefit of a reading whatever report is being supplied by by the you law know enforcement the, you know the I truth answer of the what question you know. yeah and I answer the question truthfully to all those uh, interrogation or investigations and my questions to you today you've answered truthfully that's correct yes mr. Wong our committee has had its share of blunders and mistakes in fact we've been called a parody of reputable investigations and a case study of how not to do an investigation. And I want to ask you about one of our true lows. In 1977, we had a hearing, in 1997, we had a hearing we held with a fellow named David Wang. Uh, this hearing was held in October of 1997. Prior to the hearing, the chairman told the Associated Press that the hearing was going to prove that John Wong laundered illegal campaign contributions while at the DNC. He said, this was, and I quote, the first time in my memory we have seen evidence of such blatantly illegal activity by a senior National Party member, end quote. In the hearing, David Wang testified before this committee under oath that you, Mr. Wong, came to his place of business in Los Angeles in August of 1996 and gave him cash in return for a campaign contribution. I introduced evidence that showed that this could not have happened. This evidence included hotel receipts and affidavits that showed that you were in New York, not Los Angeles, on the day in question. The Democratic members also suggested that perhaps this was a case of mistaken identity. In fact, Representative Konjorski said that perhaps the person that Mr. Wong met was Charlie Tree, Tree not John Wong. Now, we had all the receipt showing you were in New York. We had clear evidence that showed that you were in New York on the day that Mr. Wang said you went to his place of business in Los Angeles. And in light of that, that evidence, I asked the chairman to retract his allegation. And to this day, however, the chairman's refused to correct the record. I'd like to now ask you about what really happened. Mr. Wong, was David Wang telling the truth when he said that you met with him in August of 1996 while you were at the DNC and gave him cash to make an illegal conduit contribution? No, sir. Mr. Wong was not telling the truth. Mr. Chairman, I have additional proof that Mr. Wong is telling the truth here today. The committee recently received the FBI notes of the FBI interviews with Charlie Tree. In these notes, Mr. Tree says that it was he, not Mr. Wong, who met with David Wang. I ask unanimous consent to introduce these FBI interview notes into the hearing record at this point. Without objection. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Just one second. Yes. Pardon me.
the uh, FBI has asked us not to uh, uh, release those or put those in the record yet because there's information they'd still like to redact. And uh, uh, I have uh, told the FBI director and the FBI that we would honor that. So I don't think we should put it in the record at this time until they've made the redactions they think are necessary. Mr. Chairman, I, I think this should be in the record. I think you're mistaken, but I will withdraw my request and we'll talk well, further about it. But when, Once the redactions are made, we'll check with the FBI. I have no objection once that happens. But I think that when this information comes out, and I know you share my view, the American people ought to have all the truth, uh, it will be clear that you were mistaken. We all make mistakes. And you were mistaken about Mr. Wang, Wang's accusation that Mr. Wong came to his place of business. And if that's the true, that you were mistaken, I hope, Mr. Chairman, that you will admit that it was a mistake and that was a, an allegation, the allegation you made based on that, that was, in, was based on uh, in, incorrect facts. If there is an incorrection, the record will reflect that. Uh, Mr. Shays. Mr. Chairman, before I start my five minutes, I just would like to, to ask a, a question. Uh, we've had 30 minutes from the chairman and, and the ranking member, and then from this point on, we are going to be going in five-minute segments, and then yes. just continuing to come back. So we'll do five minutes, the next person, then we'll just keep going down and keep, keep doing that. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And until we, we, we've, we're ready to finalize, and then we'll have 30 minutes for staff. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, Mr. Wong, would, would you Would you like a break, Mr. Wong? Okay, why don't we Please, take, Mr. Uh, Chairman, thank take, you. Take about a 10 minute break. Thank well, you very much. Stand in recess all Sorry. together. Mr. Wong, uh, Mr. Chairman, thank what you. we were discussing was nothing of major significance. Uh, since you and your uh, your uh, legal counsel flew on the red eye, we, we assume that you're kind of tired. So what we're going to do is go till 6 o'clock today, and then we'll adjourn or recess until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock rather than go late into the evening because I think you'd probably appreciate I'm supposed sleep. to tell the truth. I did not fly red eye. I did arrive around 1 o'clock, so it's not considered red eye fully on that basis, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But my eyes are red. <laughs> okay, uh, Mr. Shays. Mr. Wong, it's uh, good to have you here. Uh, we've Thank had... you, Mr. Shea. Thank you, sir. And um, I, um, I'm going to take your statement uh, as I think you mean it. Uh, it seems somewhat conciliatory. It seems somewhat regretful. Uh, but I also want to take what you say to co coincide with your with your statement. And I need to first ask you what you mean by saying I've made some mistakes. What are the mistakes you've made? Was well, are these the, uh, the illegality of the, you know, the fund of the funds, country, uh, campaign contributions? I want you to say, so it's, what, what were the mistakes? The campaign contribution. Well, would you pull the mic a little bit closer? Yes, I'm sorry, right. Mr. Wong. Thanks. Thank you. Talking about during 1992 through 1994, that period of times, and when I was supposed to live post, a lot of money being funneled, handled through me and funneled through me. Uh, I essentially I meant that, sir. You're um, one of 79 people who have exercised their right to use their Fifth Amendment privileges for for self-incrimination, and it's a right that's available to all Americans, and you, you, you had that right and you exercised it, but you are one of so many. And um, 
being the non-lawyer that I am, you begin to get a feeling when there are so many that there's something here that people don't want us to know. Um, I'm going to focus in eventually on security issues, because that's an area that my subcommittee is responsible for. But um, my understanding is since 1985 through July of 94, you worked for the Riyadis in various uh, uh, capacities. You, you worked for them, uh, the Lippo Group, and so on. You worked for the Riyadis. Uh, is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Chase. And then my understanding is from July 94 to December 95, uh, you worked for the Commerce Department. Yes, sir. And then since then, um, uh, excuse me, from December 95 to October, November of 96, you worked for the Democrat National Committee. That's correct, sir. And then, and you raised money from the Riyadis when you worked for the, the DNC. Um, I did not raise from the Riyadis, though. From someone who gave to the Riyadis? To, I mean, were the Riyadis not involved in any of your campaign fundraising uh, efforts? The somebody... I don't want to split hairs here. I want you to be accurate. Saying, yes. Somebody's uh, family has a uh, partnership with uh, Riyadi's family's business. So you raised money from the businesses of the Riyadi's during... No, no, no. It's the individuals. Individuals who whose work for the businesses. Whose family has partnership with Riyadi family's business. Fair enough. So... They, but they are uh, the... To my... My knowledge is they have green card holders. They are eligible been, to give. Would it have been illegal for you to raise money from the Riyadis when you were from the DNC? I'm sorry, sir. Would it have been illegal for you to do that? To raise money from the Riyadis? Um, you seem to want to make clear to me that somehow during that time after um, why you worked in the DNC, you didn't raise money from the Riyadis, but, but you, you raised money from people who had business acquaintances and agreements with the Riyadis. Because I had the knowledge at that time Mr. Riyadi has relinquished his green card hold status uh, back to the United States, and he was no longer holding the PR, or so-called permanent resident status in the United States. He's, he was not eligible to give any further. Well, you could have raised soft money from them. That's not a campaign contribution. Uh, but he did not have that status, though. Bottom line is you chose not to raise money from the Riyadis, but from people who worked with the Riyadis and had business relationships. And then since uh, uh, in 97, you had uh, a gift of 18,000 from the Riyadi family. And in 98, 20,000 from the Riyadi family. And in 1999, they paid your travel expenses to go to Jakarta, correct? I paid it for, so they, they, they gave me back the money, yes. Now, um, so the picture I see is a relationship from 1985 to, to really now, uh, a, a, a relationship with the Riyadi family. Yes, yes. Um, and the one distinction you want me to be clear on is that when you worked um, at the DNC, you chose not to raise any money from the Riyadis. They could not give either in my mind, yes. And when you say mistakes, would you define any of those mistakes as illegal? Yes, it is. Okay. Now tell me the illegal things you did. The reimbursement part. Okay, just In other words, uh, although I was legally able to give money, but I was reimbursed. Uh, later on by the reality. And is that the extent of your testimony before this committee? That is the extent of your illegal activities? That's that's one part. Okay, give me the other parts. Because I, I have knowledge about at least some of the... Well, let me just say something to you. I'm, I'm not going to I'm not gonna be satisfied if you tell me that you didn't have knowledge at the time that this was illegal. Uh, let's just agree that if, if it was illegal, whether or not you knew it, it it's illegal. Now, you, uh, Mr. Shays, yes, please clarify the, the, the times you're talking about. Uh, I don't want to clarify times. Okay. I want to know what illegal acts you have done. Uh, and you regret all of them. And you have immunity for all these illegal acts. Right. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to know the ones I know. I want to know the ones you know, too. Okay. 
I was not what well, I was not supposed to be reimbursed okay. for all the ca campaign contribution that I made, but somehow I did. All reimbursed, you know, through those money. Okay. And that is your testimony before us that that is the extent of any of the illegal acts uh, that you have done. And my time is up. I'll come back. Is that the answer to your question? Is yes. Is that the extent uh -huh. of all your illegal acts? Now, I also knew the other people being reimbursed as well. That was not proper. That was not illegal. That was illegal. I'm sorry. And that's the extent of all the illegal um, action you've done. Yeah, to the to the uh, to the best I am, I can I can comprehend. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll we'll talk some more. Thank yes, you. Yes, please. Thank you. Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Wong. I wanted to uh, discuss with you some uh, some of your participation and some of the events uh, surrounding the presidential debate, uh, which took place in East Lansing, Michigan, uh, October 19, uh, 1992. Uh, I'm going to be referring first to Exhibit uh, 31, and if you have that there, we may uh, you might pull that up and we could put that on the screen. Uh, on a document for the uh, presidential debate in East Lansing, Mich Michigan, on that date, October 19, 1992, uh, James and Aline uh, Riotti are listed as guests along with uh, Melinda Lee's name. M Mr. Micah, could you get a little closer to the mic? It's hard to hear from you. Hear you. Let's move everything downstream here. Again, uh, their, their names are listed as uh, guests along with Melinda Lee Yee's name next to theirs. By the time of the debate on October 19, 1992, LIPO-related contributions topped uh, some $570,000. Is that figure approximately uh, correct uh, to your knowledge? I don't know for sure, but it's definitely over a few hundred thousand dollars, yes. And the Riottis personally contributed, we have $410,000 of that total. Uh, they also contributed hundreds of thousands of dollars at that point. Mm. I don't know exactly date, but they, they did make quite a few hundred thousand dollar contribution approximately at the time, yes. A document listing uh, the guests for the East Lansing debate lists uh, James uh, and Eileen Riotti. Next to their uh, names is the name of Melinda Yee, apparently signifying that Yee, a DNC employee detailed to the Clinton-Gore uh, uh, campaign event, was the person who arranged for their invitation. Melinda Yee was also the individual who informed Governor Clinton about the limousine ride and James Riotti's $100,000 contribution to the August 14th, uh, 1992 fundraiser. Uh, the question, uh, questions that I have are as follows. The list uh, that's on Exhibit 31 is a guest list uh, to the October 19th, uh, 1992 presidential debate in East Lansing, Michigan. Uh, on the second page, it lists James and Aline Riotti. Uh, did, uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Riotti attend the presidential debate in East Mich Michigan, to your knowledge? Mr. Micah, they did not attend, to the best of my knowledge. They did not. Right. Did the Riottis fly in from uh, I Indonesia to, uh, with the intent of intending to uh, attend the uh, uh, debate? I don't know if they were in Indonesia or not, uh, but I do know they did not attend because I attended. Yes, okay. Uh, did Melinda Yee arrange, uh, was she making arrangements for the Riottis to attend? And then you, uh, were you substituted uh, in their place? I couldn't quite recall right now for sure, but I, I did not know exactly. But I do know I did attend and my wife did attend it. Well, uh, did you work with Mr. Riotti uh, to arrange the contributions uh, so that someone could attend the event? And I guess originally it had been Mr. Riotti who was going to attend. 
I was not sure whether there was a related contribution or not. Uh, apparently, during that period of time, so there were guests uh, on the list by DNC, you know, being recommended to, to be invited. But, it, uh, did you get there through Mr. Riotti's contribution or through, through co uh, contributions that you personally had made? But I was actually raising the money at that time from various people in the group, liberal groups. Uh, so I don't know the determination on the invitation list was because the money being raised was a key factor or not. But again, um, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find out at this juncture in October, were you, uh, were you the recipient of money that was given for you to participate in an event, or was the money given from the Riottis for the Riottis to participate in the event? You know, I, at that period of time, uh, to my best recollection, I was giving the money. My wife was giving the money. And suddenly at that time, well, you know, part of the money was given by the Riyadi family as well. What were you doing at that time? Um, in 1992, as... I was still working for Liverpool Group in, the, in California. And uh, what was your approximate income at that time? At that time, uh, 1992, probably 125 to 150 in that range, 1,000. And how much were you get? How much did you give in 1992 to the camp, uh, to the uh, either the campaign or the inaugural committee? So on the campaign, I could not really recall exactly. Probably over thirty or forty thousand dollars, at least. Yeah. Were you reimbursed by Mr. Riotti or the Lippo Group for those those funds? Later on, yes. Uh, what about uh, what about the funds that were? Now, I see some funds uh, in your name, and is it Jane? Is that your wife? That's my wife, yes. And she was also contributing uh, funds, um, I guess, in her name also. Yeah, when I, when I talk about the, the total amount, that was including my wife's uh, contribution as well, sir. And was she also reimbursed for those contributions? Or I, I was handling the, Mr. Miter. The money came to you, and right, then I handled the that, uh, yes. checks were written. Uh, in 19, uh, how's my time? Do, do, are we doing double? Uh, we're doing five minutes. Uh, uh, rounds right now so uh, uh, if you'd like we'll, we'll be back to you very right. quickly well, I'll get, uh, I'll get uh, further into it uh, thank you mr. thank you mr. mr. Souter thank you mr. chairman I want to uh, apologize mr. Wong for the fact that each of us are taking kind of different lines of questioning and because we couldn't get in the rules 10 minutes where you could kind of get an order to it uh, you'll see I, I'm going to be asking a series of questions regarding mr. Hubble and I'll come back to that every so often so you kind of see a pattern here, but your mind's going to be pretty tried because you're going to be moving between different scenarios because we couldn't get a longer questioning period. The first question I would like to ask is, when did you first learn that Web, Web Hubble needed financial help? Probably uh, spring of uh, 1994. Uh, was this at a reception? I believe your uh, FBI deposition said it was at a reception in the spring. Uh, Mr. Souther, can you hold on just a second? So essentially, the news I've learned from, I believe, is from Mr. Doug Buford of the uh, law firms from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, and basically. And I was, uh, I believe he, he mentioned to me, I was, I was told he was uh, uh, indicating Mr. Hubble was need some help, financial help. Well, um, was that at the reception where you first heard it? No, it was through a phone call, separate, yeah. So you first heard it at a reception, and then Mr. Buford, was he talking about Mr. Hubble's children? 
No, I believe I heard that through phone call ahead of time from Mr. Buford. The reception was in Washington, D.C. later on. Uh, I was giving a, a car, a business car later on by Mr. Hubble. Okay, at this, uh, I want to go back to the reception where it first started. Was that at the White House, the DNC? What kind of reception was it? I could not remember the, the location of the reception. I did not believe that was in the White House, though. Do you believe Hubble. it was a political reception or was it a... You don't remember? I do, I do not remember. Um, did uh, you have said before and, and here on the record that it was in the spring, uh, Mr. Hubble called Lippo Bank twice on May 19th, 1994. Do you think that was approximately the time of the reception? Uh, I would believe if, if your records indicating the phone calls made in May, probably that reception was happening before that already. Because, um, uh, and, and uh, because it also shows up a little bit later in June that you uh, have said that Mr. Riotti asked you to step up of a meeting. So probably the order here was you heard at a reception that he needed help. Then clearly he made some calls on May 19th to Lippo Bank. Then do you know approximately the date when Doug Buford would have uh, called you? I cannot really speculate. About, I, I do know for sure it's a prior to that. Mr. Sauter, I think the, in terms of sequencing on that is the best I can recollect is I, I learned from this information from Mr. Buford through phone call indicating he was uh, needing the help. And I also learned somebody was trying to set up a trust fund for the children. Uh, and then over the time I had a communication with Mr. Riotti about the fact and Mr. Mr. Hubble needs help. And then the receptions, probably there's a chance I met with Mr. Hubble, and there was an indication to Mr. Hubble the same Mr. Riotti might be coming back to the United States in June sometimes. So I'm pretty sure the main call was pursuing for the, might be the appointment to exactly time, the date, how they might be able to meet. I was trying to, you know, arranging the meeting at that time. Could you explain for the record who Doug Buford is? Uh, Mr. Buford is, is also is an attorney with uh, uh, Wright, Lindsay, and Jenny. It's a law firm in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's also a friend of mine and also to the Riotti family. So he's this Bruce Lindsay's law firm? Uh, former law firm, yes. And he was a friend of yours when you were previously with the bank in Arkansas and other? Uh, I learned him not that early. Yeah, but it was, you, was, did you was, know him in Arkansas, or did you know him only once you came to Washington? I knew him uh, when I was still in, with the Lippo Group in California then. When, when there was any, um, when there was uh, any of these contacts to you when you first heard he was uh, needing help and, and or the trust fund regarding the children, was there any mention in the same discussions about the independent counsel investigation or his cooperation? No, I did not know that. Uh, in other words, it wasn't even discussed, not no, necessarily in time. No, sir. I mean, it seems just to a casual observer that there would have been a lot of concern and a lot of discussion anytime Webb Hubble would have been around about what's happening in the counsel's office. So you didn't hear any kind of concern about Mr. Hubble and, and he, him feeling persecuted or uh, what are these crazy Republicans in the House going to do next? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, that did not, it did not register in my mind at that time. Um, after you heard that Mr. Hubble needed help, did you discuss it with Mr. Riotti? Yes, I did. And when approximately would that have been? Um, again, during that spring time, it's probably uh, April, May, around that time. But before the visit in June? Oh, definitely, yes, sir. Multiple times? Uh, occasionally, Mr. Riotti will call on a routinely, like uh, on average once a week, we're checking in what's going on in the operation in the United States. So we're talking about various things. Did you ever discuss with Mr. Riotti that Mr. about Mr. Hubble's problems and why he was having problems, that he was being investigated, and, and uh, f because of that reason he would need money? Not in detail. Um, what does not in detail mean? My hunch is Mr. Riotti probably has a CNN and, you know, overseas, he would know about that. I, I just mentioned to him 
you know, he, he's really in trouble, he needs help. And, and you I mentioned to him about somebody who's trying to set up a trust fund, you know, uh, on that basis. The trust funds can only limit, I believe, a person can only give up to $15,000 maximum. I pass those information to Mr. Riotti. Thank you. I'll return later. Thank you. Mr. LaTourette. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wang. I is a coordinated monthly test of the broadcast stations of your area. Equipment that can quickly warn you during emergencies is being tested. If this had been an actual emergency, such as a tornado or flash flood or a civil emergency warning, official messages would have followed the alert tone. This concludes this test of the emergency alert. The proceeding was brought to you as a community service of this cable company. Struck when you said that things might have gone easier for you. I, I think uh, I was a prosecutor for six years, and the only thing that could have gone easier is if they'd given you something. Uh, that, that's a pretty good sentence, and I don't know if Mr. Cobb and Mr. Keeney were your lawyers, but if they are, they're excellent lawyers, and they're to be commended for negotiating that, uh, that agreement. But uh, then when you were talking to Mr. Waxman, and I, I want to be real clear about this, that, that crime to which you stand convicted today was for activities that occurred between 1992 and 1994. Is that right? That's correct. Specifically, in response to Mr. Waxman's series of questions, you indicated that while at the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, that you engaged in no illegal activities, and likewise that you were not aware and you did not uh, participate in the making of any illegal contribution to the, either to the Democratic National Committee or President Clinton's re-election campaign in 1996. Is that right? And that is correct. Okay. Uh, there was just a, a television program on recently where they would ask a series of questions and they had lifelines where you could phone a friend or 50-50. And I, I would ask you, is that your final answer, that you did not commit this same type of conduit scheme to defraud the United States of America in 1996 that you engaged in between 1992 and 1994? To the best of my knowledge, yes. Let's talk then about some fundraising events that took place in, in 1996, and I want to turn your attention first to one uh, that occurred on February the 19th uh, of 1996. You're familiar with that fundraising event? Yes, uh, Congressman. And it's my understanding that that was the first fundraising event that you would, first major fundraising event that you might have been involved in after you went to the DNC. Is that correct also? That's correct, sir. Okay. Do you remember what the goal of that fundraiser was? I tried to try to set it about $1 million, sir. Okay. And, and is that a figure that um, you established for the fundraising event? Was that a figure given to you by the DNC, the presidential campaign, or was that just, how'd you come at a $1 million? I just, just I, I set that goal for $1 million, sir. Okay. And do you recall, if this was on February the 19th, do you recall when you would have become, uh, started uh, beginning the planning for that event? Yes, ever since I joined in the DNC, starting from December 1995. Uh, Do you recall communicating to anyone else that you needed to raise $1 million at that February the 19th event in order to get the president's attendance uh, at that fundraiser? Yeah, maybe, yeah. And, and in particular, do you recall such a conversation with Charlie Tree? Uh, yes, that, I do. That the $1 million would be required to secure the president of the United States' attendance at this fundraising event? Um, I really cannot, Congressman, cannot e equate a million dollars to get President coming in. Probably a lesser amount you can get President coming in. But so I set my goal, hopefully I can raise for a million dollars. That will be the first time the Asian American community can raise that kind of money on records. And, and you just mentioned Asian American community. Was there a target audience or group that you hope to solicit to attend this event on February the 19th, or was it anybody that was inclined to give President Clinton money to run for re-election? Primarily in the Asian American community, sir. All right. And the price for this event, was, my understanding was $12,500 was the cost of a ticket to attend this event. Is that right? That is correct. And that included not only the dinner on the 19th, but also a, vice, uh, a, a 
uh, breakfast the next morning with the Vice President of the United States, Mr. Gore. That is correct, sir. Was there a, another requirement as to a, a different contribution level to be entitled to sit at the head table at that event? I did not set that level. But people, some of the people might have given more money. Some of the people might have historically made uh, supporting Democratic Party, uh, which is known to everybody. Uh, and also, because of diversity, ba for the diversity basis, I'm trying to have a different Asian American uh, uh, community to be represented on the head table as well, sir. Did you select the composition of the head table at that event? Primarily, yes. Yes, myself, yes. Okay. Did you, as you sit here today, and maybe we can go in the next five minutes, if you don't remember, do you remember what the head table was comprised of at the February 19th event? I, I can remember some of them. Okay. Can um, you just name them for us? Um, Pauline Kanchanala. Pauline Kanchanalak? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think either Mr. Tashon or Mr. Tashon's guests. Um, I just need to go back to the list, you know. Well, that's to okay. Find I, I, yeah. I, we can talk about that in a little bit, and I'm not trying to stump you. Um, but uh, we'll go over some names maybe in my next five minutes. Uh, specifically, uh, Charlie Tree. Uh, and, and maybe the chairman asked you, when, when did you meet Charlie Tree? Uh, the first time probably in the summer of 1994. I heard of him much earlier, but the first time I met with him was uh, in summer of 1994. According to the information that I've re reviewed, Charlie Tree was a very active donor to the Democratic National Committee, but he was not an active fundraiser, if, if, if you understand the distinction, in that he would contribute money on his own, but until you got to the DNC, uh, based upon what I reviewed, is the first time that he actually became a solicitor of others. Would, would you agree with that observation? That I would not know, but... Uh, he was, a, he was a donor at that time, already established record in, uh, in front of DNC before I arrived at the DNC. Did you have conversations with him to encourage him to become not only con continue as a donor, but also to be a solicitor of others? Uh, I did. I did encourage at, him to do that. After you got to the DNC? That is correct, because I was trying to set a, a, a goal for the million dollars. I need everybody's help. That's Thank why I ask him. Thank you, Mr. Wong. Thank sure. you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got five minutes now. And I, I, I basically covered the, I think, the essential, important to questions in this whole investigation. And I appreciate your, your answers to them. But some cleanup questions, if I might. Mr. Wong, there have been a lot of allegations about the relationship between the Lippo Group and Web, Webster Hubble. William Sapphire, for example, wrote in July of this year, we will never know if the $100,000 that the Riotti family paid Hubble was, in Thomas Jefferson's phrase, hush money, to keep him from telling prosecutors about the part played by his Rose law firm, billing partner, Hillary Clinton, in his sham deal. Mr. Wong, uh, that's what Mr. Sapphire had to say. You had a role in the payment to Mr. Hubble. Was the money paid by the Lippo Group to Mr. Hubble hush money? To the best of my knowledge, it was not. What do you know about the money Mr. Hubble received from the Lippo Group? This is basically a, a, a help from a friend. The, the friend is in trouble. Why do you think Mr. Hubble was paid this money? Uh, Mr. Riotti is just trying to, based on the friendships, would like to help him. To your knowledge, was the president involved in any way in the decision by the Riottis to hire Mr. Hubble? No, I don't know about that. Mr. Wong, while working for the DNC, you played a role in organizing an event at the Shi Lai Temple in California in April 1996. The event was attended by members of the local Asian American community, along with Vice President Gore. Since then, there have been allegations that members of the temple made illegal conduit contributions to the DNC. In fact, one woman, Maria Shaw, faces trial next year for conspiring with temple leaders to make conduit contributions. Now, let me ask you, Mr. Wong, did you know anything about these alleged uh, uh, conduit contributions? I did not know. A parliamentary inquiry? You might make a parliament, and at that time, Mr. Waxman's. Gentleman may state his parliamentary time. I'm not trying to. Um, we have a lot of redacted material related to that particular fundraiser. 
Um, are we going to be allowed to ask questions about that, and what is the standard going to be in these hearings? We, we can ask questions as far as the redacted material is concerned. Uh, uh, that's been redacted by the Justice Department and the FBI, uh, but uh, questions can be answered, asked of Mr. Wong. C continuing my parliamentary inquiry, uh, then people should realize that when we get answers that he may not be able to say certain things and we may not be able to put certain things in the record that would clarify those questions because we are restricted as to what we can talk about. Yes, I think that's correct, and I think you can stipulate that in your question. I, I, I thank the, the uh, chairman and the gentleman for yielding, and he should get the time. I apologize. Yeah, we'll, give, we'll give Mr. Wax one. May I ask a question in response uh, to Congressman Souter's question? Well, we normally don't allow I, no. uh, uh, counsel to uh, a, a, a ask questions. I just uh, want to make sure that my client understands the ground rules, because he indicated that Mr. Wong may be under some restriction as to what he can answer, and I don't, that's not my understanding. No, of the there, there's, there's no restriction whatsoever on questions that he may want to answer. And, and I apologize, but the councils are not allowed to answer questions. We've, we, that's a very strict rule. Mr. Waxman, we're going to give you additional time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate Mr. Souter's point because uh, I think the essential thing with redacted information is that if we have that information, we're not permitted to make it public. But we're certainly permitted to ask you questions right, right. Uh -huh. about what you know about uh, matters that we may have had some information about. And I asked you whether you knew anything about these alleged conduit contributions at the uh, Shilai temples. I did not. I did not know. And did the vice president know anything about these alleged conduit uh, uh, contributions, to your knowledge? I don't think so. I don't believe he did. Were you at that event? I was in that event. Was it a Democratic Party event, or was it a, a community event? It's, I have a misgiving in explaining the things. I don't know I should at this particular time or not. Uh, uh, originally, the, there was a fundraising event supposed to be in a different location. And there was supposed to be a community event in the Shilai Temple. But later on, the scheduling problems and uh, everything was planned. So we had to combine everything together. So. So uh, I don't know how to answer that. It's basically it's a lot of community people coming in. A lot of community people from the Asian American community were at this event? It's a lot of community people came into the event, yes. And uh, Vice President was there, but were, were there other office holders there? There's some, uh, I think one of the supervisors in the LA County, Don Kanabi, he was invited as a guest. I think he's a Republican the last time I checked. That's correct, yes. Um, you've admitted soliciting contributions for Bill Clinton and the DNC in 1992 and 1993, but you also solicited and contributed money for a variety of national and local candidates, including Republican senators such as Al D'Amato, Mitch McConnell, and Larry Pressler. I'd like to ask you about those contributions. Did you contribute money? to Mitch McConnell, the Republican senator from Kentucky? Yes, I did. How much money did you contribute? I don't know if it's a thousand or, or for myself or another thousand for my wife or not. It could be only one thousand dollars at this time. And why did you make this contribution? The reason is at that particular moment, we were trying to push the immigration bill. So uh, we can't we can do, get a help from the Democratic side. We thought we also need need to get the help from the Republican side as well. So I think that that was a conscious decision from the from then the PLC, Pacific Leadership Council's member, we need to do something for the Republican senator as well. And was that your reasoning in giving to Pressler, Senator Pressler and Senator D'Amato as well? Uh, the other minor reason was uh, uh, Elaine Chow then was also introducing uh, Senator, uh, not Senator D'Amato as I'm talking about Mitch McConnell right now again. Yes. She was also there. That's she his was wife. A, was that was his wife at the time? No, not not down then. Oh. Yeah, she was a very distinguished, you know, Chinese American community leaders then. Yeah, now she is his wife. For Mr. D'Amato was a was a different reasons. Uh, there were more reasons because I received a call from uh, Miss Elaine Chow uh, because I was a banker then. 
was in the banking business and she was asking whether I could support Mr. D'Amato because Mr. D'Amato was coming in town, uh, indicating Mr. D'Amato was in the banking committee. So with, with his uh, recommendation, I did support Mr. D'Amato. I'm out of time, but these don't se seem like they're significant to me. Do they have any significance to you that, and, to the and to the reason we're holding this hearing? Do, do you have anything to tell us about it? That might show some significance in regard to these contributions? The, the only thing is that these funds were reimbursed later on. And so uh, they, they were reimbursed later They were reimbursed later on, you know, in, into a one lump sum group basis later on. Whatever the contribution I made, and I totaled it up, and uh, in a future date, and I, I got reimbursed. Oh, I so see. this is a part of that. So these are part of the conduit contributions? That, that is correct, made. sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Were the uh, individuals like Senator McConnell ever made aware of that uh, money being conduit contributions? No, sir. Well, we probably ought to tell them about it. They may want to send some of that back. Well, let me let me ask you about the uh, about the temple. You had eleven nuns who have taken a vow of poverty that each gave five thousand dollars. To whom did they give that money? I believe the, the check was made out to DNC, if I'm not mistaken. But who, who took the money? Did you take it? I did not. Who did? Uh, the, a stack of checks was handed to me on my way to, from Los Angeles to DNC. So, so you, you had the stack of checks in your possession? No, through, in the envelope through Maria Shah. But you, but you saw the checks? I did not really examine the check. You until didn't I, look at the checks? Until I get back to... Yeah, when you came back to Washington, did. did you I look did. at the checks? I did. Did you see that they came from the nuns? Yes, I knew they came from nuns, yes. Where did you think the nuns got that money? All right. Here's the thing, understanding, Mr. Chairman, uh, in, in our culture, in our society, and some of the nuns, or even individuals, they made a lot of money. They decide to feel their life is still empty. They, they gave the money. You, you thought the nuns actually gave the money themselves? No, they gave money to the temple, for instance. They gave every property to the temple. Basically, they're very wealthy themselves. There are quite a lot of people like I know, that. but where do you think the nuns got the $5,000 that they gave to the DNC? Well, I was told some of these nuns were very wealthy. There was their money. So you, so you believed that the 11 nuns gave the 5000 themselves? Yes, I did. You had no doubt about that? I did not at the time. Let me go back to uh, my original line of questioning. Why did Mr. Riotti need to tell President Clinton in the back of the limousine that he was going to give him a million dollars for his campaign? I, I do not know. Who proposed that he ride in that limousine with President Clinton? Did you have anything to do with that? I have something to do with that. Well, why did you arrange for Mr. Riotti to ride in the back of the limousine? But he would like, uh, Mr. Riotti would like to have a chance to have a, you know, a little moment with Mr. Clinton. But you didn't know anything about the million dollars he was going to talk about? At the, at, pri at the moment, no, in terms of how much amount he was trying to do. Were there other people uh, that were involved in uh, asking that Mr. Clinton ride in the limousine like Melinda Yee or Bruce Lindsay or Governor Clinton or Rahm Emanuel or Melissa Moss? I would not know about that. Well, you, you arranged for him to ride in the back. Uh, the primary persons that I was contact with was Melinda Yee because uh, Melinda Yee at that time was working with the DNC. But you didn't, she didn't say anything about anybody else asking her about meeting with uh, Mr. Riotti in the limousine. I, I did not recall there was any other persons who were involved. When, would you, when were you told that he was going to be taking that ride? Was it just before or was it sometime before? What's before? Just recently or sometime before? Oh, you, uh, was it a day before, a week before? Or? Very close to the event because they could not really find out what would be the format for them to meet. Well, who told you that? I don't know if that was Melinda Yee or, uh, or not. I, I tend to think it was Melinda Yee. It wasn't uh, Bruce Lindsay or Rahm Emanuel or Melissa Moss? No, I did not know Bruce Lindsay then. No. 
Okay. When did James Riotti conceive the plan, or do you know when he conceived the plan to give a million dollars of the president's campaign? Probably uh, a few weeks before that. But you didn't know about it until uh, the limousine ride. No, I did not know about the limousine ride. You, did you know about the million dollars that was going to be offered to him before the uh, limousine? I was trying to explain to you, Mr. Chairman, is uh, remember I went, I testified to you uh, originally, you know, I was trying to mention his friends who need to support him. And I was suggesting something like uh, much less amount. If we need to support him, maybe we should support like $100,000, okay? Now, he was thinking about the concept, if you really want to support what I support, much larger amount. So you suggested to Mr. Riotti a $100,000 contribution before the limousine ride? No, it was way back, a few weeks back already. Well, but it was well before that. Right. Who else besides Mr. Riotti knew about this plan of giving a large amount of money to the president before the limousine ride? Did you convey that to anybody else besides uh, Mr. Riotti? Oh, no, no. You didn't tell anybody no, else that? No. How long did that limousine ride last? Probably about five, mo no more than 10 minutes. If it's a, the driver drives slowly. Mm -hmm. As I testified to you earlier, Mr. Chairman, so the two locations was all in the same city in San Gabriel. Who was in the car besides uh, the president and uh, Mr. Yeah, I don't know because everything is under security, so. They all went into the elevator, go all the way downstairs to the parking lot. So I did not head up. So you don't know if Bruce Lindsay was in the car with him? I would not know, sir. Were any notes taken of the conversation that you know of between the president and Mr. Riotti? I would not know, sir. No. Following the limousine ride, did you and Mr. Riotti discuss what happened? Yes. And can you tell me what he told you? Uh, he said he mentioned to I could not say the exact words, but I can paraphrase as, as close as possible, sir. You see, he said he would like to help Mr. Clinton for his campaign or fundraising, whatever, for a mil raise of uh, a million dollars. And Mr. Clinton's, Mr. Riotti showed me the response of Mr. Clinton was very surprised, the gesture, you know. Did Mr. Riotti indicate that he wanted anything in return for the million dollars? Oh, no, dollars? no, sir. He just wanted to give it out of the goodness of his heart. Uh, Mr. Chairman, they, he likes the help of the friends. They knew each other. Well, and also, <laughs> I wish know, I knew some friends like that. <laughs> I'm, just give him a million dollars for his campaign out of the goodness of his heart. To give a political contribution, certainly you will get some recognition on political fronts. Uh, Mr. Riotti probably has uh, multiple purposes in doing so, you know, for his business and also for his... So you believe he had some multiple purposes, but you don't know what they were at the time? I can speculate uh, for you right now. What would you speculate? You cannot speculate? You I, I can. I, well, I can. Can you speculate right now? For the status, as I mentioned already, you know, the standing, and, and also the benefit for the business. Later on, he will get recognition and also can tell the people in Asia he knows Mr. Clinton. And all of these things probably will be part of the, the benefits that I, I think he might be able to get. But, but you don't know whether or not he discussed anything in particular with oh, the no. president? Oh, no. No, sir. Uh, Mr. Shays. Mr. Wong, uh, given the five-minute process, um, we are keep doing five minutes going to the next, so I'm just going to review where you are with me. Um, where you are with me is that you made a, mis a statement that said you regretted your mistakes. You didn't call them illegal actions, so it's mis illegal actions plus mistakes. Um, where you are with me is basically the, the recognition that you worked for the Riottis from 85 to July of 94. You worked for Commerce from July 94 to December 95. And you worked um, at DNC, Democrat National Committee, from December 95 to October, November 96 where you raised money. And uh, where you are with me is that afterwards, uh, your relationship uh, continued with the Riottis. They gave you $18,000 gift in 97, $20,000 gift in 98, uh, and they paid for your travel to Jakarta in 99. So that's kind of where we're at. 
uh, you then acknowledge that you regretted illegal acts that took place in 92. I want you to spell out what those illegal acts were. What did you plead guilty to? I get reimbursement for my contributions. I knew of some of my colleagues who, who were reimbursed and also, I forgot to mention to you in the last round, for, I just thought of that. And also, I gave some of my colleagues money for them to write check, but that was a very relatively small amount. And that was money that wasn't necessarily yours that you gave to others to write out? That is correct, yeah. And okay, that was money from whom? From me first, and later on, I also reported that back to not, Mr. Not, Reality. Not from you first, it was, my, okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, then you, then you were reimbursed later? That is correct. From whom? From Mr. Riotti. Um, what was the amount, total amount, of these uh, transactions during the 92 cycle? Directly related to me was... I, I can only go by the report that the government has investigated on that. No, you can go by what you did. You'd know what you did. I, I really don't have a exactly records right at this moment. Probably, I can only think about is probably based on records about 150 some thousand dollars. Okay, well, here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow when you come back, I want the, the real number, not, not the record number. I want to know all of those transactions, not the ones you necessarily pleaded guilty to, because that's the difference here. The difference is you pleaded guilty to something, you have an agreement. Right. And that's what you're guilty of, uh, according to the court. But I want to know what you did that may have extended beyond that you didn't plead guilty to. So I, I, I and you can, you can provide that information to me tomorrow. Um, okay, sir. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Now, um, my understanding is that you didn't plead guilty to these actions, and you may not feel you're guilty, but uh, these are mistakes as well. Uh, according to our information, you raised $3.4 million uh, in, uh, when you were at the DNC. That so far, $1.6 million had to be returned. They had to be returned because they were illegal contributions. I still do not know the real reason behind, this, behind the returning of that $1.6 million. I did not really have a privilege in knowing that. DNC did not really tell me about that. Uh, I don't know what the true reason on that. But at the time when I collect those money, I did not have any of those information, whether it was well, illegal or not. It would be helpful for you to be prepared tomorrow when we go through that number. And we'll go through each of the numbers and why they were returned. They were returned because they were illegal contributions. Believe me, the DNC or the RNC is not going to return money uh, if they if they, in fact, uh, were raised legally. Um, and with all the ways you can get around the law and be legal, it's really significant when you have to return the money. Because you can raise money from corporations and labor unions and from foreign governments and have it not be illegal technically under the law if it's soft money. So this is money I would like to have you explain. Gentlemen, like, yield to me. Yes. Just to, happy to. to make a point. Um, he may or may not know about the source or a reason for the return of the contributions from the DNC, but as I understand it, in some cases, the DNC returned money if they didn't have sufficient information to know whether it was a legal contribution, well, as well, well as it. contributions they knew to be illegal. So, uh, Henry, uh, maybe what you could do is you could come tomorrow and, and uh, provide us the information on why they took the $1.6 uh, and and gave it back. Uh, because uh, they wouldn't have done unless they felt they needed to. And Thank you for helpful. giving me the homework assignment, but I'm just simply informing you that from the press reports that I've read, that they uh, gave some back and uh, right. for no, different and I, reasons. I, but you can ask the DNC. I have time. no knowledge myself. Re reclaiming my time. It's just that since I yielded to you, and you seem to have a, an opinion about it, maybe I think then you could share the information. The bottom line is the DNC. The DNC returned 1.6 million, and uh, I'd like to know uh, why they returned 1.6 million dollars that you raised. 
and um, we'll go through that, but I suspect that's also a mistake, and you did it while you were at the DNC. You raised this money while you were at the DNC, correct? Mr. Shays, I really did not know why they returned this. it. Did yeah. you raise this money while you were at the DNC? That is correct. It is money returned, uh, some of it illegal. And yet, in response to Mr. Waxman's question, you said the DNC did not do anything illegal. You were an employee of the DNC. I want to make sure that, that you aren't uh, splitting hairs here. If you raised money as an employee of the DNC, the DNC did something illegal. No. At a time when I raised the money, DNC did not know those things was illegal. Right. And your testimony is that you didn't know any of that money was illegal? That is correct, at the time when I raised it. Now, but it's also a fact that just because you didn't know it doesn't make it illegal. I mean, we don't have that convenience in, in, in to be able to say, since I didn't know it was illegal, therefore it's not illegal. It was illegal. And I wonder if your answer to Mr. Waxman was as candid as it needed to be. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I want to seek my five-minute round now. Uh, you, you've had five minutes. That was on the last round. Well, we, we, we go, we go. If the gentleman would permit, no, we, because we, we, I would we, like to be able to respond to some of the points well, that were just the, made. Well, the reason we're, we, we have a limitation of five minutes, and we're just going right down the line, and we'll come but, back but, to you just point a Point of order, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mike, we're in the second five-minute round. I have not had a chance to do that, but to participate in the second. We did this, the round. You, you concluded uh, the first uh, five-minute uh, round. Right. I then did. we started the second five minute I know, round. You, we're, going in, we're, we're going in order. Right. Well, then you got to come to All right, our well, side go ahead. for the well, second go, five go minute go ahead. round. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Wait, well, may, may I be clear on one thing? You, you, uh, I make an assumption that you said 30, 30 minutes each. And so, Mr. <coughs> uh, Mr. Burton, you used your 30 minutes and you used your 30. So the same thing would apply to you, I guess, as well. It would, but we'll go ahead and let Mr. Waxman go now. Mr. Waxman. Well, before you all applaud yourself for being so generous, the rules are that when you have a five minute round, each member gets five minutes, goes back and forth. And you'll hear only from Republicans from here on out in asking you questions. But if you um, receive, if you uh, solicit a contribution working for the DNC and you don't know that it's illegal, and you receive it and the DNC doesn't know it's illegal, that doesn't mean that you committed any illegal act or the DNC committed any illegal act. Is that correct? That's correct. But it, it, Mr. Shays is correct that it is an, an illegal contribution because the person who gave it might have given it improperly or illegally. That's an after Is that your fact. understanding? That's an after So uh, I've heard, and I don't know what the DNC records are, but I'm sure this committee has asked for it, and so somewhere or other maybe we can get that information out. The DNC, after the presidential election in 1996, found out that some of the contributions that they had received, thinking were legal, turned out to have been improperly made to them, and they gave some of them back. Is that your understanding as well? That is correct. Now, uh, they, I also understand that some of the contributions they received, they couldn't figure out whether they were legal or not, and because they didn't have sufficient information, it didn't make it illegal. They just, because all this turmoil was going on in the press and the Republicans were screaming and yelling, they just returned the money to the contributor and, and, and uh, for, for no particular reason except they, the appearance. Is that your understanding? That's as best so I can, I can understand, yes. So before Mr. Shays gives you a homework assignment and gives me a homework assignment, he ought to ask the members of the staff of this committee that subpoenaed over a million documents from the White House and the DNC and everybody else in sight to give us this information because I don't know if you're going to be able to answer questions that you don't know anything about, and I'm certainly not going to be able to answer questions that I don't know anything about. So I, I, want, to, I want to put that on the record and, uh, and, and, and people understand. It's the same as Mr. Shays receives a campaign contribution from Mr. Burton or I, and we don't know that it came from somebody uh, that was not entitled to give us a contribution. We try before we dis uh, receive it or when we disclose it to make sure that it wasn't a, 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 a corporate contribution, which would be illegal. Uh, if we find it's corporate, we return it. Uh, it if, if it were a corporate contribution, it's not illegal unless the person making the contribution knew that it was illegal to give it. Sometimes people give a contribution, they write it out of their corporate account, and, uh, and then we draw their attention to the matter, return the contribution, and say, we can't, we can't accept it. If we knew it were corporate, right and then we accepted it and used it, um, then uh, that's a different story. 
I wondered also, just because I have the time in a, in a few minutes, Mr. Burton seems shocked that anybody would give a million dollar contribution out of the goodness of their heart. Well, people don't give contributions out of the goodness of their heart. Um, maybe Mr. Riotti was doing it because he wanted uh, to impress upon President Clinton that he was giving him or going to raise him a million dollars. And as you indicated, he had a multiplicity of motives. Isn't that right? That's correct. He wasn't doing it just out of the goodness of the heart, his heart. He won, probably, I'm conjecturing, but he wanted the status of riding in the limo, the limo with the president, right. being able to be uh, someone who could call on the president as one of his major supporters and friends. There are a lot of friends people have in politics, and the friendships defined under our crummy campaign finance system as people who give us money. They become our friends. They're the ones who get access to us. They're the ones that are meeting in the congressional offices all the time. The tobacco industry happens to be a very close friend of the Republican Party. They gave $8.8 .8 .8 million to the RNC. Now, they got a tax break, which they couldn't hold on to when it became public, of $50 billion. And there's an uh, uh, organization called Amway. Their founder, Richard DeVos, and his wife gave a million dollars to the RNC in April 1997. During the 1997 budget, Speaker Gingrich worked to secure tax breaks worth more than $200 million for Amway. Well, I, I, I don't know Mr. DeVos, but I know he's a very devoted Republican. He probably ideologically likes the Republicans and wants to help them succeed, but it doesn't mean that he wouldn't come and ask for some, some assistance from them. Uh, there's a Texas businessman by the name of Harold Simmons and his family, they gave $1.5 million to Republican candidates since 1980. The 1997 budget gave them a $60 million tax break. Now, are these quid pro quos? They didn't maybe say, I'll give you this money, you give me a tax break. They suddenly became friends of the people who were able to write the tax laws because they control the Congress. So, if anything, Mr. Shays ought to understand, because he's said it over and over again, this campaign finance system is disgustingly corrupted because people are out raising money all the time. And, there, and the, the, the limits that we used to have that try to bring some sense to the, to the laws are out the window. It used to be when we ran for Congress, we could get no more than a $1,000 contribution per person. Well, sure, but you can give $10,000 of corporate money to the Republican or the Democratic party building organizations, and then they run the commercials. The American people know this system stinks. Some people have tried to change it, like Mr. Shays. But if you go down the list of members on this committee, I don't know, most of them probably voted against Mr. Shays' bill. I voted for it. And the purpose of this investigation should have been to change the campaign finance system. Instead, as I have said over and over and over again, and will continue to say, the purpose of this hearing, since it's only looking at campaign issues relating to Democrats is to use the taxpayers' money, $7 million in the last Congress, to try to figure out ways to make the Democrats and President Clinton look bad. Well, we all look bad when we have a campaign finance system that we have at the present time where people are out raising money. Even the chairman's raising money. I'm raising money. Everybody's raising money. And then our friends who give us the money want to come in and talk to us about things of mutual interest. My time, I see, is up. But I felt uh, that I really ought to throw this information out there. Let's not kid anybody about what's going on. We've got a system where everybody's out raising money, and, if, and, uh, and it invites corruption but on, on, on the part of people involved in it. Thank you. I'll take my five minutes real quickly here. As time goes on, we will get back into the Riottis and the Lippo group ties to the uh, PRC intelligence agencies. We know through Johnny Chung that $300,000 was given to him to be given to the President's Re-election Committee. He testified under oath by the head of the People's Liberation Army's intelligence agency. And Mr. Chung, uh, Johnny Chung knew that uh, he was subject to perjury charges as well if he lied. So the People's Liberation Army's intelligence agency during the time that uh, espionage was taking place at Los Alamos, and they were getting nuclear secrets, were giving money to the President's reelection committee. That's fact. 
Now, Senator Lieberman said, and I said this earlier, quote, non-public evidence presented to the committee, that's intelligence information, demonstrates a continuing business intelligence relationship between the Riottis, the Lippo Group, and the PRC Intelligence Service. So once again, you got the People's Liberation Army and Communist China tied to the Riottis because of our intelligence services stating that. Now, we can't go into the details, but that's fact. Now, Mr. Riotti, a member of that group, gave a million dollars to the president's campaign. He knew it was illegal. Now, that's different than somebody doing something, even though it might be illegal here in the United States, because we're talking about a foreign government or foreign entity that has ties to the People's Liberation Army and their intelligence apparatus giving a million dollars, and we don't know what the reason for that was. So, you know, there's an awful lot of things here that we ought to be concerned about. In addition to that, let me just talk to you about what we were talking about earlier and what Mr. Shays was talking about. You knew that you had given or raised money illegally. You've already admitted that. Right. When did you know that that money was illegally raised? You know, starting from 1992, from 1992. Yeah. So you went to the DNC uh, as one of the financial uh, uh, fundraising leaders over there after you knew you had broken the law and you had raised money illegally. You knew that. Now, after you went over there, you raised $3 million and $1.8 million was returned because it was illegal. Now, you've sworn under oath here to tell us the truth, and you said that you didn't know that money was illegal. But you know it has to raise a question in some of our minds. You knew you were raising money illegally back in 1992, 1993, and 1994. But when you went to the DNC, you raised $3 million, $1.8 million, which was returned, and you're saying you did not know that that was illegal money. That is correct. At a time when I raised the money, I did not think the money I raised was illegal when I was in DNC. When you were at the DNC, you did not think it was illegal. Right. But the money you raised prior to that, back in 1992 and three and four, you knew that there was illegality involved then. That's correct. And so you went to the DC and you raised this three million, you didn't continue the practice of raising the money illegally. No. And yet 1.8 million was returned because it was illegal. I did not know. Again, Mr. Chairman, I, I know, but the point is, I mean, you can understand how we might be a little bit concerned because you raise money illegally knowing it. And then you come to the DNC and you raise $3 million plus and $1.8 million is returned just like the other was illegal money. And you're saying you didn't know that when you were at the DNC. The, the matter, it was illegal during 92 and 94, Mr. Chairman was re related to very close to the group, which is within the local group executive was not going outside, outside that group, as you probably know from the, from, from the, from the records. Mm -hmm. But when I was in the DNC, I did not really go into the practice. I can go to the, you know, the general public, basically, in the Asian well, American Well, I think community. you can see, Mr. Wong, how we have some concerns and maybe some doubts in the back of our mind, because if it was illegal here and you were raising money and you knew it, and then you go to the DNC and you raise $3 million and $1.8 million is returned because it's illegal, you would think that you might have known that because you were doing it previously. It was a previous mode of operation. Let me go back to some other questions because I want to stay on this one theme that, uh, or one issue that we were looking at regarding uh, the, the limousine ride because there was a lot of things that we're going to uh, try to get to uh, regarding that. Did anyone suggest that Mr. Riotti should not give a million dollars in contributions to the President's committee or to the DNC? You talking about raise a million dollars? Yeah. Though. Did anyone no. say that he should not do that, raising it from the liberal? I have no knowledge on that. So when he no. told you that, uh -huh. did you say anything to him about, hey, you know, that may not be the right thing to do because it's money coming from a foreign corporation? I did not. You didn't say anything? I did not say anything. Are James Riotti and President Clinton the only two people who can say what actually happened in that limousine? To your knowledge, was there anybody else in the limousine that could say what happened? Beyond these two persons, I don't know anyone else who knows. Okay. Exhibit 24, if we can, uh, maybe you can look at Exhibit 24 in your book there. This is a chart of the LIPO-related contributions uh, after Mr. Riotti made his $1 million promise to President Clinton. If you could look at that. 
were all of these people either lippo employees or spouses of lippo employees yes mr chairman they were were all of these contributions made to fulfill mr riotti's promise to raise the million dollars that will be part of the plan yes do you recall any more contributions toward Mr. Riotti's goal that are not listed there? Do you recall any other contributions toward Mr. Riotti's goal that are not listed in that list? Now, this list, Mr. Chairman, was, uh, was during the 1992, that period of time. Later on, there were some more names. Those, that list there is from 1992? 1992 or 1993, around that period of time. Mm -hmm. All these things were handled through, through the hands of, through my hands. Yes, my I hands understand that. Were, were any other contributions uh, that you know of given based upon the commitment that Mr. Rowdy made in addition to those? I mean, is that the only group of people that gave money? Th uh, there will be more than that. There would be more than that. There will not be too many more than that, yeah. uh, Mr. Chairman. Okay, and you were the one that was in charge of soliciting this money for the Riotti Group. That is correct. Okay. Uh, Mr. Micah. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, in uh, my first uh, part of questioning, Mr. Wong, uh, I went over uh, the contributions prior to the presidential debate and leading up to the debate, and I think you testified that there were hundreds of thousands of dollars that before that uh, went to the Riottis, and then you said you had also contributed tens of thousands at that point in, the, in 1992, and, uh, and you also received conduit uh, payments and also said you, uh, your wife had, uh, uh, had participated, actually you had, pers uh, you had performed uh, that uh, activity for your wife. What I'd like to do is move now into the Asian Pacific Advisory Council, uh, also known as a APAC, uh, uh, which was set up by Nora and Jean Lum in California. Uh, and its inaugural event was uh, October 27th, 1992 in Los Angeles. Did you attend that event? I did attend it. Did. Uh, in her deposition, and see, you fit into the bigger picture of how things uh, took place and who did what in this. Uh, it, and uh, again, uh, different uh, parts of this scheme to funnel huge amounts of money into the presidential campaign and, the, and uh, other activities, and some of it, again, from foreign sources. Uh, in her deposition, congressional deposition, Melinda Yee denied any involvement with APAC uh, or APAC vote, apart from the fact that she said she attended the APAC votes award uh, ceremony in 1992 along with Maria Haley as staffers from the Clinton-Gore campaign. Although uh, uh, Melinda Yee was being paid by the DNC at that time, are you aware of that? Wait, and she was at the event? And Melinda Yee was at the event, yes. Yes. Um, Yee said that APAC uh, vote was not affiliated with the DNC in any way. However, their pro to the, uh, in their pro-offer to the committee, the LUM state that they opened an office for an organization affiliated with a DNC. Um, and uh, that's thir Exhibit uh, 33, uh, as uh, dated October 12, 1992, says, I authorized Nora Lum and it signed Melinda Yee, Director of Constituency, she, and she's setting up that uh, vote project. Is that correct? I, I had no knowledge about this arrangement. You have no knowledge, but uh, she was at the organizational thing. And I point out for the committee that this is contrary uh, to uh, the information uh, given in her uh, dep deposition. Um, exhibit... Uh, 32, just before that, is a letter to uh, your wife, I believe, uh, thanking her for a contribution to this uh, 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 Asian Pacific Advisory Council, APAC, um, and it's signed by Nora Lum. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. Okay. Uh, further, uh, 
documenting the involvement of Melinda Yee for the benefit of the committee and the record, uh, I refer to Exhibit 34, which shows extensive involvement and a memo from Melinda uh, Yee to Nora Lum in discussing all of the details relating uh, uh, to this, uh, this fund. Do you have any uh, knowledge of this particular memo dated September 2nd, 1992? Congressman Mike, I do not. You do not. Uh, another uh, document here is Exhibit 35, which lists uh, those uh, who would be present on election night produced by Melinda Yee, and it does list, uh, that's uh, Exhibit 35, it does list, I think, uh, you on the second page and also the Riottis on the second page. Uh, were you aware of Melinda Yee's involvement uh, in preparing this list? I don't know if she actually prepared the list or not, but I was in the Little Rock at night, the election night. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, involved, and now you were involved in the DNC, and uh, there, we've, we've had testimony uh, in deposition that, uh, that there was no affiliation between APAC, this Asian Pacific uh, Council, uh, and the DNC. Uh, did you know if there was a relationship between the two? At the time, I did not know because I, the only knowledge I knew is that Ms. Lum, Jean Lum was trying to organize something and trying to drum up the vote, you know, from the Asian community, set up an organization like that. And I did attend the, uh, the kickoff function. And did you or the Lippo group uh, uh, provide funds to this, uh, this organization and in what amount? I probably did make contribution to that event, maybe a very small amount, either 1500 or $2,000. That including my wife, though. And was any of that money reimbursed to you or were those personal funds? I, I believe it, it did get reimbursed later on. You were reimbursed for right. that? Um, let me ask you, too, in, in closing, and my time is running out here. Uh, we have records, and uh, the, uh, the committee has exhibits of showing uh, uh, money from bank accounts uh, during different uh, periods. Uh, some of that, I guess, was wire transferred or entered into the LIPO accounts. And there was some cash that was brought into the United States and some cash you received. Did you? receive all of your money through checks or through wire accounts, or did you also receive cash in or for reimbursement? The some period of time in 92, I did receive some in cash. In 1992. Okay. But Was that given? To, who, who gave you that cash? The, the cash is the, I believe, in final terms, was handed to me through uh, other liberal co-workers. I'm sorry? Other Lippo co-worker who was uh, working closely was Mr. Riotti. Did, did Mr. Riotti give you any cash directly, or uh, this was from Mr. Riotti through a, a wor uh, one of his uh, uh, employees or workers? A few incidents. Some of the cases I like, like that, as I just explained to you, but some, one case he gave me the cash or travel checks. And uh, what amount? It's about $10,000 in aggregate. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Chairman, my time is expired. Mr. Satter. To uh, briefly review, I'm back to Webb Hubble, uh, that uh, you saw him at a reception, that uh, you got a call from Doug Buford uh, about raising uh, him needing help. You, uh, you believe that the phone calls from Webster, Webb Hubble to Lippo Bank were probably to set up an appointment time. Uh, I have a couple other questions. Did D Joe Girard also contact you about helping or making you aware of Web Hubble's situation? Uh, I couldn't quite recall Joe Girard was involved in that, in, in that instance, though. Okay, so Doug Buford was your main contact. That is and he correct. was with Bruce Lindsay's former law firm. That's correct. Um, that, uh, when did you first meet Web Hubble? Was that reception the first time? No, uh, the first time I met was uh, Mr. Hubble was in the inauguration in 1993, inauguration night or whatever. You didn't know him when he was back in Arkansas? I knew of his name, but I 
didn't believe I met him before. How would you have known of his name? You were, you were just for the record, you were the far Asian, you did far Asian bank things related to the Worthen Bank out of Arkansas, and he was with the Rose Law Firm at that time. Did you know him in any way regarding Arkansas business? No, my role was basically in Asia when I first time when I jo joined the Lippo Group in Hong Kong. But Lippo at that time already uh, took the, uh, some major interest in the uh, Worthen Bank. And I believe uh, Mr. Hubble uh, was working for the Rose Law Firm. Rose Law Firm was also had some uh, client this is a client relationship. It was, uh, was either Worthen or Mr. Riyadi at that time. So you at least knew his name, although you did not know him? No, that's and correct. And did you know him uh, very well? Would you call Mr. Hubble a friend? Or would you have called him a friend at the time they first contacted you regarding money? Well, I considered him as a, as a friend, since he's a friend of my, uh, my employer. Uh, when did Mr. Now you said that Mr. Riotti, he may have, when he was at Rose Law Firm, been working with Mr. Riotti way back in Arkansas. Do you know that for a fact? I, I don't know for, for a fact because I, I do recall there is a conversation that Mr. Riotti mentioned to me how he knew Mr. W uh, Webb Hubble. Do you know what he would have done with uh, Mr. Riotti at that time? Uh, I didn't quite understand Mr. Sauter. In other words, uh, what I'm trying to establish is the, did Mr. Riotti consider Mr. Hubble personally a friend? That's correct. And uh, according to, to Mr. Riotti to me, as mentioned to me about that. Did he refer to him as a longtime friend? Or do you think this was more, uh, in other words, you said you considered Webb Hubble a friend in a kind of in a second degree. He was a friend of your friend. Did Mr. Riotti, business acquaintance, longtime friend, uh, uh, or was this uh, because you made the statements that you believed that he did this and you felt he should help with the funding and you would help because of friendship. What did friendship mean? Because he's been knowing him for a long time. And uh, you also said that you had discussed with Mr. Roddy regarding Mr. Hubble's pride. So the money was going for friendship, not for a job? Or was, the, in other words, the job merely came because it was less embarrassing for Mr. Hubble? Uh, to the latter was the, was the answer for that, sir. Um, the, um, you said earlier in response to a question that you weren't sure, but you wondered whether the fo two phone calls to Lippo Bank on May 19th may have been set up to a, an appointment with Mr. Riotti. Did Mr. Riotti ask you to set up an appointment yes, for the June meeting? He did. So to your knowledge, he hadn't set one up by phone because you were the person who actually executed the appointment? That is correct. Could there have been another meeting that we don't know about here between Mr. Riotti and, and Mr. Mr. Hubble? Or Prior to June? Yes. No. Mr. Riotti at that time, I believe, was, in, was overseas, was not in, in, in the States, sir. Do you believe that Mr. Riotti had any contacts with Mr. Hubble separate from any contacts through you? That I would not know, but I don't believe so, though. Because generally you were considered the point person in this. That is correct, sir. Um, that when Mr. Riotti came in in June, he brought $32,000, $17,500 in traveler's checks. And as I also recall from your other uh, Justice Department testimony, his expenses were largely covered. So what did he do with the money he brought over? I would not know. I would not know. Because he had a whole family coming over in the summer, generally also in the wintertime for vacations. Uh, it is not unusual for him to bring, you know, that kind of sum of money with them. To your knowledge, none of that went to Mr. Hubble? No, I, I, I don't think so, no. no. Could it have gone to Mr. Hubble? I don't think so. Why don't you think so? Um, I believe that would be their personal spending money. I, you know, there was an arrangement for the later on, $100,000. That was a very good sum of money already. Did you travel to Little Rock, Arkansas with Mr. Riotti in June? I didn't quite recall, Mr. Uh, Mr. Saw, that there was a trip to Little Rock in June, though. What, um, originally, Mr. Riotti had appointments in Washington for the 21st and 22nd. Uh, it was then changed, and he was here longer through the 21st and 25th, but he made a trip into Little Rock. Uh, but you don't recall whether you were involved with that? And could... Mr. Sard, I, I really don't have any recollection he left town for, for Little Rock during that, that week, though. Uh, um, I, I don't know. 
did you travel with Mr. Riotti to Washington in June 94? Yeah. And yes. you didn't go from Little Rock to Washington, to your recollection? I personally, in my recollection, I did not go leave town. Okay, I may try to follow up with that tomorrow with some yes. more documentation. Yeah. In the, um, uh, do you know why Mr. Riotti would have changed from staying the first two days to staying longer? Originally, I think the presidential gala fundraiser was the 22nd, but then additional meetings were set up. Is that why he lengthened his stay? Was that a surprise? Um, I don't know if there's any reason why he changed that. He did not mention to me he was originally staying there for two weeks. He would be available for the whole week there. That's my knowledge. Did the Justice Department ask you any Thing about telephone calls between you and Mr. Riotti that week? In June the 20th in that week? June 21 to 25, did the Justice Department ask you about any telephone calls to Mr. Riotti or visits to the White House with Mr. Riotti? Yes, I, I was with him in Washington, D.C. with Mr. Riotti, I mean. Okay. I'm going to ask more questions. What my question is, is did the Justice Department in their depositions, because we don't see that, uh, did they ask you about your visits to the White House with Mr. Riotti? I believe there were several in the week of June 21 to 25, and the telephone calls uh, made by you uh, and Mr. or Mr. Riotti. I believe so, yeah. Mr. You Sullivan. believe the Justice Department yeah. asked you right. those questions? Right. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Norton, did you have any questions? Mr. Lotteret. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wong, I, I want to go back to uh, what you and the chairman were talking about, and I know that it's going to sadly consume a lot of my five minutes, but the great thing about this hearing is I got three more days to go back to the February the 19th uh, fundraiser. I, I think where you got sideways with, with, the, with the chairman and, and what is troubling to, to some members on, on this side of the aisle, and, and, and I know you can clear it up, is that when I asked you before, what you've pleaded guilty to is this conspiracy to defraud the United States of America based upon illegal campaign contributions. And the way that a conduit scheme works, and I, I want to make sure that it's included in the record for people reading this later, or if there's someone watching it on the internet or at C-SPAN, so that they understand. If, if I take $20 and I give it to, to Mr. Shays, and I say, give that $20 to Mr. Burton, it's really, the contribution came from me. It didn't come from Mr. Shays. I've used Mr. Shays as a straw man. And what makes it illegal is, is because it's, well, there's a couple things that makes it illegal, but if I've already given Mr. Burton more money than the law allows me to give, then that makes it illegal because it's really my money. Or if I'm a person that can't contribute or participate in, in giving money, that, that could be another example. And, and that's the crime of which you stand accused and convicted, is it not? That, that that's, you were donating money, others were donating money, and then they were being paid back. So the money really wasn't coming from you, because you got to, you, the realities were paying for that. That's the crime to which you pled guilty, right? That is correct. Okay. When, when the chairman was talking to you about the, the vice president's fundraiser at the Buddhist temple, the same scheme is going on. The, the nuns, whether you know about it or not, the nuns who have taken the vow of poverty have written checks for $5,000, but you know today that it was not their money. They were straw people for other people that wanted to make a donation to the vice president or the president's campaign. It's, it's the same scheme. You, you grant me that, do you not? I read on the newspaper. I don't know the detail, the real, real the full fact, though, sir. Okay. Well, well let's go to the, the fundraiser that we were talking about then on, on February the 19th, because we now know today that at that fundraiser, through the help of, of Charlie Tree, there were a number of illegal contributions made using this same scheme. And, and in particular, I'm talking about contributions made by Davidson Wu, Ernie Green, uh, Lei Chu, uh, Kesha, Kesha Zahn, uh, Manling Fong, Joe Landon, Yu Chu, uh, Min Cheng, Charles Chang, um, Zheng Wei Cheng, uh, the Dihatsu International, and Jack Ho. A and as I understand it, you are testifying before this committee that that you did not know when you accepted the, the, the money for this February the 19th that they were illegal. But we now know today, because of the investigation, because of the testimony of Charlie Tree, because of things that you know, because the DNC has turned the money back, that the same thing that was happening. That is, that people were making donations to the campaign to reelect the president, but it wasn't their money. It was money that, that maybe, maybe wasn't given to them up front, but it, somebody said to them, if you write a check for 12500 to the committee to re-elect President Clinton, I'll give you the $12,500. It's, it's the same scheme. 
uh, uh, for which you stand convicted from 1992 and 1994. Do you, do you grant me that? That's right. Okay. So do you see that it's that kind of, that's what makes us suspicious over here. I mean, I, it's, it's not that, I don't know anybody that thinks that you're a bad guy. I, I think that what you've done is not so good. But, but the fact of the matter is, you stand convicted of this setting up a straw man between you and a campaign. The nuns who took the vow of poverty are straw people between whoever really wants the president to have the money uh, and the president's campaign. And this list of people to a fundraiser that you were in charge of in February the 19th of 1996 have done the same thing. Now, it, it, it is, I mean, people say, well, what a coincidence. I mean, you seem to be around all the, this same sort of, and that's what makes us suspicious. And, and so I hope you, you understand that we ask, as you ask you questions, right. that's, what, that's what raises our curiosity. And, and, uh, and I hope you understand that. I, we were talking about this fundraiser, and now I probably have about 30 seconds left, but did, did you at any time discuss with Mr. Riotti, James Riotti, the event that you were putting together on February the 19th of 96 about their help? I, I might have mentioned to me I did an event for the million dollars probably afterwards when some occasion of, you know, I saw him, oh, I, had, I saw him. Yes. But, but specifically requesting his help or anyone from the Lippo Group to help uh, with that event prior to the event? Oh, no. Uh, and what was your understanding, going back to Charlie Tree, that, that he did for a living in 1996? Did, do you know what he did for a living? I think he, he was in the trading business, I think. Right. And, and were you or, or, Excuse me, or some real estate investments in business. The way I understood he might have made some money in the real estate investments uh, in, in Asia. Okay. Some, some very good sum of money. I might yeah. be wrong on that, though. And, and did you have the, the chance to meet his uh, Macau-based partner, a fellow by the name of Ng Lap Lapsang? Uh, during that uh, fundraising uh, period of time, you know, in February 19, around that period of time, I did meet with him. And, and what did you understand that, that Mr. Ng's business was? What, what business did you think that he was in? Probably either in the real estate investments or also in the trading business. Did you ever have a conversation or a discussion with Mr. Ng with, as to whether or not he had a relationship with the, uh, the communist Chinese government? No, I did not. Did Mr. Ng ever indicate to you that he had ever received money from the Chinese government? No, sir. Before you uh, went to work at the DNC, had you ever had any direct fundraising, done any direct fundraising work with Charlie Tree before you went to the DNC? No, sir. As I reported to you earlier, I, the first time I met with Charlie Tree was in June or in the summer of 1994. And when do you think that, again, the planning for this February the 19th event, when do you think uh, it, your best recollection was that you would have first discussed uh, Mr. Tree participating or helping you with this February 19th, 1996 fundraiser? It must have been probably in the January of 1996. And, and in that vein, did you ask him to contribute to the event? No, I said I'm doing something for the, for, the, for the event. It's for Asian community, and I'd like to him to help me. And, and, and did, that, did that, in your mind, mean that he should write a check and contribute to it, or did it mean that he should contribute to it and help you identify other donors? Or did it mean that he should contribute to it and help you identify other donors to contribute to the event as well? We, I did not really discuss about the detail and then basically as long as he can raise the money or he can give the money, it doesn't really make any difference to me at the time. But, but uh, again, the money, did, were you only looking for $12,500 for him or were you looking for him to attract more money than that? Oh, basically uh, through his connection, you know, and uh, he can raise more money for, the, for, for, for my event. Okay, and, and, and that's what I mean. So you saw him not only as a person that could write a check, but you were hoping he could get other people to write checks as well. Uh, Congressman, if it's a soft money, the person can write a check for $100,000 himself. Okay. This is also okay. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I'm not trying to trick you, even though right. I, I see that. I, I'm just asking, were you saying that, you know, Charlie Tree, write me the biggest check he can write, or when you said, will you help with the event, were you hoping that he would not only make whatever, 12, 5, 100, whatever he wanted to write, but that he would get others to write checks to participate in your event. That, that's what I want to know. Did you see him as a one guy that was going to give money no matter what the amount was, or did you hope that he would be a guy that would give money and get other people to give money? I did not really discuss the one form or the other. Basically, I, I, I felt he was a source of help to me. And whatever the format, it, it, you know, it ends up, it's okay to me. 
I thank you for answering right, my thank questions. You, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Waxman. I'll, uh, Mr. Shays, did you have uh, questions now, or do you want to pass? Henry, do you want to? I, I uh, am entitled to five minutes, but I'll uh, defer it now and let other members continue with their questions. Well, we're, we're, we're getting to the point where we're probably going to want to uh, end around 6 o'clock. Uh, uh, I'm ready to end now. Well, then you don't, you don't have any more questions? We're coming back tomorrow. You don't have any more questions tonight, then? No, I'm not giving up my five-minute round, but I don't want to pursue it right okay. now. Okay. Uh, why don't you go ahead? And we'll, we, instead of having five minutes, you're going to have ten this time. Well, this is a, an, an added That's going to take tonight. unanimous consent, but... Uh, oh, no, he's getting his extra five, is what I'm saying. Th this will be the next round, is my understanding, and I'm happy to, okay. I'm happy to participate That's in the next fine. round. And as a courtesy to the other members that may want to wait until later. Did, did you, uh, as you were talking to Charlie Tree about this event on February the 19th, 1996, uh, discuss or ever have a discussion with him uh, as to what the rules for, uh, in other words, you indicated to me in the other question that someone can give up to $100,000 in soft money and it's okay. Did, did you ever have a conversation with Charlie Tree as to what the rules were for uh, donating to, uh, to an event such as you were speaking? Congressman, I did not. The reason is he was quite established in front of the DNC. He was a, the major donor. And I would assume he knew about the rules. Okay, and, and likewise, I, I guess I would receive the same answer if I asked you if you ever discussed the currency transaction reporting requirements with Mr. Tree. I would assume you didn't do that either. I did not do that either. I want to talk to you next about a fellow by the name of Antonio Pan. Uh, do, are you uh, acquainted with this individual? And I, I knew of you. this person, yes. Okay, and I, and I would ask you uh, when you first met Antonio Pan and what you knew about his professional background. Uh, Antonio Pan used to work for Lippo Group. Uh, he had a background in a, in a trading business. Uh, he might have joined the Lippo Group in, back in probably beginning of the 90s. And later on, the, he was not working for me or directly related to me. He was working with the projects in, in Asia while he was joining a group. Probably uh, he had some responsibility related to the real estate portion in China related to Lippo at that time. It, it's my understanding that at one time he worked for a subsidiary of Lippo called uh, TATI. Tati, is that that's involving the real estate development in Fujian province, as far as I know. So, so that is a real estate concern of the Lippo Group that is concerned with real estate inside? No, Tati was a specific project to develop the whole uh, a bay area and industrial complex uh, out of the uh, Mr. Riyadi's uh, you know, hometown, uh, original ancestor uh, town from, from China. And, and so, uh, again, the, the answer to my question is that this particular project, however, is located within uh, the People's Republic of China. That is correct, sir. Okay, and, and that's what Mr. Pan did at one point in time, is, is headed up or was... As far as I know, yes. Uh, Are you aware at any time that Antonio Pan then came to work for Charlie Tree? Uh, yes. For whatever reason, the project was under... The whole project the, uh, in China was under the reducing scale. Maybe he was no longer working for the Lippo, and he left. Uh, and, and do you have any understanding of what he did for Mr. Tree, what, what work he did for him after he left and, and went into Mr. Tree's employment? The best I can recollect at that time is trying to uh, organize certain things for Mr. Tree. Did what? I'm sorry. Organizing things for Mr. Tree, yeah. Okay. I, what sort of things? No, the detail part is, you know, Mr. Tree is basically the... Uh, I don't know him very well. I have to speculate. He was not really organizing. He's a businessman running around. He did not pay attention to the detail. He needs somebody to help him on that. It was more right. like a personal assistant. Like a right-hand man that you right. would delegate. That's right. I, I want to, I don't know if that we can, I sort of don't want to catch the staff by surprise, but I, I would like to refer you to something known as Exhibit 316. 316. And Exhibit 316 uh, is a series of $1,000 traveler's checks from the Bank of Central Asia in Jakarta. Mr. Tree, uh, to our knowledge, used 200 uh, of these traveler's checks for a variety of purposes in 1996, including the reimbursement of political contributions made by uh, Manling Fong, Joseph Landon, and Jack Ho. I, I think when I was talking to you in my last five minutes, I was indicating that some of the people that Mr. Tree solicited for the event that you were in charge of on February the 19th have been determined to be illegal. 
uh, and they have been determined to be conduit uh, contributions, wherein they made the contribution, but then somebody gave them the money to cover the cost. Specifically, uh, Exhibit 316 represents uh, $1,000 traveler's checks that were used by Mr. Tree to pay back these three individuals uh, for contributions that they made to the February the 19th uh, event that you were in charge of for the Democratic National Committee. And, and I would ask you, prior to them, you now looking at them or looking at them on the screen, are, are you familiar at all with, with these traveler's checks? No, sir. Did you ever discuss uh, the idea of traveler's checks with Charlie Tree relative to this event? No, sir. Did you ever discuss the traveler's checks with Antonio Pan? No, sir. Do you have any knowledge as to the source of these particular traveler's checks? No, sir. So, uh, specifically, you have no idea as to whether or not uh, Mr. Tree received these from the Lippo Group or the Riotti family? But that is correct. Are you able to make out the signature on the traveler's check? Uh, on Exhibit 316? Yes, sir. I don't know the signature. Apparently, there's a, there's a last name called Ho, H-O. Okay. Uh, and... Uh, during the time that you were debriefed by the Justice Department, did, did they ever inquire or ask you about these traveler's checks and, and their connection with the February the 19th, 1996 fundraiser? No, no, sir. At, at any time during your acquaintance with uh, Charlie Tree, did you ever discuss with him any travel that he, he might have made to Jakarta? Oh, he had some businessman, business contact in, uh, in Jakarta. And, and was that the subject of conversations that you and he might have had? Oh, he was talking about business contact, he, businessman he knew in, in uh, Indonesia. Okay. Specifically, are you aware of any relationship between the Tree family and the Riyadi family? No. He had, to the best of my knowledge, he had no relationship with the Riyadi family. I thank you, and I thank the chairman. Would yield back my few seconds? Would the gentleman yield to me for one question? Oh, sure. Yeah. Happy. Uh, you, you indicated that Antonio Pan worked for the Riyadis, and that the Riyadis, there was no connection between the Riyadi family and Charlie Tree. So how did Anto Antonio Pan come to work for Charlie Tree if there was no connection? Who, who introduced them to each other? I mean, how did Antonio Pan start working for Charlie Tree if he didn't know him, and if the only connection Antonio Pan with, with the Charlie Tree would have been through the Riottis? The best I can know, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, there was another person who used to be Antonio Pan's boss. Uh, happens to be a, I don't know if it's a real brother-in-law to Charlie Tree or not. Uh, so that's how the connection between them to know each other, I believe. Well, it's quite a coincidence. Mr. Waxman, do you have a I'll pass. Mr. Shays? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Wong, um, I want to uh, be clear on how you define uh, your terms a bit, just so I make sure that we're both talking the same way here. And I want to clarify some points. Uh, you pleaded guilty to conspiracy in terms of certain fundraising activities. And basically, it, you were the conduit for other people's money. Whether they gave it to you at first and you paid it, or whether you paid it and then they paid you, bottom line, uh, that was a major part. Um, and, as, and you were also aware of other people who were doing that as well, and that was part of of the conspiracy, um, others were being a conduit for funds, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm not clear as to the amount in which you pleaded uh, guilty to how much of this kind of activity, what did it add up to in dollars? I'm fine. Sorry about this, sir. I'm not in a rush. We, we have time. 
I'd rather just get an accurate answer. I know that. I'm going to argue this way. I'm just buying time. Okay. $156,000. This is cover local argue, which, which was the amount argued at your sentencing. Okay. In addition, though, I know. Uh, there's another approximately $750,000 to $800,000 to the president's campaign. Now, during the uh, congressman, sorry for the delay. Sorry, yeah. You don't need to apologize. Right. The, uh, during the plea agreement, let me explain that. The, the argument, you know, the government argued for that amount was 150,000, 50 some thousand dollars. So said, and then in addition to 150 that. 150 or 50, you said. 100 and some 50, 150 some thousand dollars. Okay. Probably 156 being exact. Okay. But in addition to that, because of the, the nature of the con doing the money, probably involved maybe another seven or 800,000 dollars altogether. Okay. Now let me uh, explore the seven to 800,000. Is, is this money that you did that you did not uh, have to plead guilty to? In other words, you, you uh, were the conduit for seven to 800,000 more, uh, but it wasn't part of the, of the specific charge? I need a little time on that, Cam. Again. Can, can I interrupt for just one second? We understand that uh, the lawyer's conversations with their client may be going across the television airways, and so you should be if you want to keep it confidential between you and your client, uh, I'm just telling you this uh, because you have that privilege. And, I, and I'd also like to say, I'm sure the chairman will give me the time requisite. There is no problem with you taking as much time as you need to answer these questions, because this is not just an hour's hearing. We have time, and we want to be thoughtful. I, so, thank you. And, and I just want the congressman to understand it's because there's a, there's a couple of legal issues that make answering this difficult, but I think we're almost there. Okay. Congressman Shays, if, if I might. Yeah. You have to forgive me. O only your client can respond. That's the rules of the committee. But if you want to have him respond. Okay. He doesn't know the answer. That's why I was trying to be helpful and explain the legal what point. What was the question, here. Mr. Shays? The, the, the question is, um, Mr. Wong is a, a, acknowledging that he has 150000 uh, that bears directly with conspiracy. Um, and laundering the money, uh, and I asked him, is that the full extent of it? And, and then I was hearing a number of seven to 800,000, and, and we need that defined. I don't know if he can't, Mr. Wong can't define it, then I think we need the lawyer to, uh, with unanimous consent to well, explain. unanimous consent that uh, will allow the council to... Uh, I have no objection. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, and my only purpose is to be responsive, uh, Congressman, that under the, the law that governs what a prosecutor can do, prosecutor under these circumstances with a cooperating witness, particularly one that's co cooperated this extensively, can only argue at sentencing for the amount that he could prove independent of the cooperation. Right. So the independent proof was for $156,000. Mr. Wong advised him of another approximately $800,000. Okay. I, I hope that clarifies yeah, that, it. That clarifies it. Um, would you define... Uh, that other seven to eight hundred thousand dollars what kind of contributions they were and, and were they the same type of contributions yes during that period of time involving all the executives of the lipos so the lipo group uh various people contributed and we can assume that they were paid back and it wasn't actually their money is that correct that's how i i, I would answer the question yes. although i did not directly go to verify whether you receive the money from somebody or not. It was your sense, and that's why it's responsive, it was your sense that that was in fact the case, that this ultimately wasn't their money. That, so yeah. that's, so um, that's a sizable amount of money. And um, let me ask you this before I just learn a little more about that. Is there any other money in addition to this, since you have immunity uh, during any time from 1990 to the present, 
uh, that you were a conduit for or knew others were conduits for that you had some involvement in? I could not quite recall at this particular moment, sir. Yeah. I don't, I don't think so, yeah. yeah. Uh, do I have a few more minutes, Mr. Chairman? Uh, because the legal counsel, if there's no objection, we'll let you have another minute. Um, you, you, you made it clear to me that, or, or it's not clear to me, but you, you said that when you were at um, the Commerce Department, you had interactions with, you did not have interactions with the Riyadis. Is that correct? You did not? I should not say that because sometimes they they visit towns and as a friend, so I, I just say hello. I've so is it your testimony under oath that it was purely and totally personal and it did not relate to any of their business activities? That's basically correct, sir. But then you said, then you, I'm sorry. Yeah. But then you said you had business dealings with business associates of the Riyadis, partners of the Riyadis. Is that correct? Why you were at Commerce? You you uh, mentioned. Excuse me. Why you were at the DNC? Um, you didn't say that, but let me ask you this: right. Why you were at Commerce? You. You, you, your only dealings, it's your testimony, you know, the only dealings with the Riyadis was personal in nature and did not involve any uh, uh, business activities. You did not uh, try to help them financially. You did not try to help them in their business dealings while you worked at Commerce. Is that your testimony? The only exception, Mr. Shea, was uh, I introduced uh, Mr. Joe Girard to my senior in the Commerce Department, uh, David Rothkoff. Basically, just introduced him, that's all. In the early, probably around the August of 1994, when I just joined uh, the Commerce Department. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll continue when my time uh, is returned. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. Mr. Souter. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like unanimous consent to put into the record. Uh, Mr. Waxman had earlier referred to comments by William Sapphire. I think it's only fair that the full article be inserted in the record and also a Washington Post article and on, also on the Hubble meetings. Without objection, so order. Um, I wanted to come back to my Hubble questioning again. <laughs> um, a, a couple of things to, to clarify. My last question to you was, did the Justice Department ask you about visits to the White House by you and James Riotti during the week of Jan June 21st to 25th? You and Mr. Riotti, according to records, visited the White House six times, and your answer to me was that the Justice Department had asked you questions. Yes. Um, what did you tell them about the visits? The reason I ask you that is the 302s that we have show no questions from the Justice Department. It could be redacted materials, and that's why I would like to know what they were asking you about. If I can recall correctly, the spaces, the question was related to my, the activities when I was, we were in Washington, D.C. during that week, you know. Um, you know, I, I might have a, I might have a confused that that was the independent counsel's office. Okay. So, so let me then ask the question a different way. In any of those six visits to the White House that week, I, in response to a question from Mr. Waxman, you said Mr. Riotti had a multiplicity of interests. Did he talk about any of those multiplicity of interests in any of those visits to the White House where you were present? Not that I know of, sir. So you went to the White House six times mainly for social and pictures and so on, or were there any policy discussions? Sorry for the delay, Mr. Sauter. Uh, 
the activities over there is not all the ways for five, six times go to the White House to see the president. Also, there were some activity meeting with some of the acquaintance, uh, you know, the other people. And uh, some of the meeting I did not even attend myself. Okay, I'll have further questions about that probably but, but, into tomorrow morning. The problem with this is we're having to do deposition type things. Many of these questions may not yield much in information because we didn't get any pre-screening. So I'm doing the best I can to try to get to some points. But I have some follow-ups with that. But Another, Mr. Uh, Sauter, before you, you follow up, I can, I can tell you there's a one event he did meet, meet with the president, which is on the radio address on Saturday, I believe, on that week. And in the... Um, uh, well, I'm going to follow up. I want to come back to June, uh, the early June. I mentioned about you going to Little Rock around uh, with Mr. Riotti earlier. That if, if we could uh, put this, uh, okay. uh, we've redacted the, the numbers and so on, but your American Express, I believe it is, or it's a credit card, I don't know what it is, um, shows that you rented a car and were in Little Rock the uh, 19th to 21st. Um, you don't, but you don't remember anything about that visit being in Little Rock. It does not show. Is there an exhibit number? Uh, no, this was not an exhibit. It was, what happened, I had a question that asked about uh, you being in Little Rock, and then I asked staff, why would you have thought he was in Little Rock? Okay. And so they said, well, from the expense records, which was not an exhibit, it's, it, I was just trying to establish whether you remember being in Little Rock that time. We can't, we can't see can, it from the monitor. Can, uh, can we make a copy and give it to, uh, to Mr. Wong? Can you give me the time, and maybe I can, I try to help out. 19 to 20, it's, the car rental shows 19th to 21st. And Mr. Riotti's coming, you head back to Washington at the same time Mr. Riotti does. That also shows plane tickets for Mr. Riotti coming in from New Orleans. And, and since you and he arrived at the same time in Washington, the question, since you had a rental car, was were you together in that period? No, it came in from a different direction. I don't think he was in Little Rock. If this expense reports, uh, no, this American Express charges is on my name. Definitely, I was in Little Rock. But I didn't believe Mr. Mr. Riotti was in Little Rock at that time. When you were in Little Rock at that time, did you do anything at that point with Webb Hubble's funds? Uh, I don't remember exactly what I do, but I do remember I did not meet with Mr. Uh, Mr. Webb Hubble in Little Rock, I'm talking about. And, um, and you don't recall being with Mr. Riotti until you got to Washington? That is correct, sir. Okay, in the uh, uh, period, um, uh, in Washington, uh, in Exhibit 97. Um, if Exhibit 97 could go up on the screen. It says that uh, John Wong called at 910, wants to arrange a meeting with you tomorrow uh, with Mark Littleman, Little, Middleton. Why did you call him for a meeting? Oh, Mark Middleton was an acquaintance of uh, myself and also with Mr. Riotti. It is, his age group is closer to ours, and also his position is less junior, so we normally work with him. We go to see him also first. But see him about what? Just to do a social call? Or was, I mean, presumably Mr. Riotti comes in and wants to talk about business too. I mean, was it about Web Hubble? Was it about other interests of Mr. Riotti? No, the, the, for Mr. Riotti's discussion that I did not know, I do remember there was a luncheon in the White House that Mr. Riotti had with, uh, with Mark Middleton, which I did not have a privilege to attend. I was sitting, wait, sitting in the reception room though, waiting for them. Do you know where you were when you called Mark Middleton that day? I had to assume probably was in the hotel in Hay Adams, probably. The reason I wondered is because your rental car is in Little Rock um, that day that you called Mark Middleton. And uh, the reason, when you try to put this together, what's, what's confusing, and I, I mean, we don't know, and that's why I'm asking you the questions, but it appears you're in Little Rock, you're calling for a meeting with Mark Middleton, uh, you're not with Mr. Riotti, so you must be doing some sort of scheduling for Mr. Riotti. 
and, and the question, the logical question is, since you're in Little Rock, is this have anything to do with Mr. Hubble? Because it's, you, you've just had a meeting with Mr. Hubble. You're trying to set up meetings with Mr. Hubble. It's the time you're talking to Mr. Rowdy about the money with Mr. Hubble. So we're trying to establish here what points of contact were made. And could this have been partly as part of the effort uh, to find out what Mr. Hubble needs? But that, to answer that question is not. At this moment, I could not really uh, trace my memory what, what I was doing in Little Rock during that period of time. I was trying to arrange a very schedule for Mr. Riotti when he comes to town during that week. Maybe one of the meetings trying to for Mr. Riotti to meet was Mark Middleton, and along with the others. What other reason would you have to be in Little Rock at that time? I cannot. Did you go to Little Rock very often? I mean, is Occasionally, that... I do. I do. Do you have business interests there? Mm, I do not personally have any business interests over there. Relatives? No, uh, no. It's, it's, I mean, not, not to say anything negative about Little Rock, but it's not a place that you probably went to vacation. Uh, it, it was not a vacation. I mean, yeah, Arkansas is, but not Little Rock. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to make an excuse. Everybody from Arkansas mad at me. Just, it seems like an, an odd place, an odd time to suddenly pop in there in between the meetings. Mr. Roddy's in Washington the 13th. He's in Washington the 21st. You don't have business interests, you don't have relatives, and all of a sudden you're going into Little Rock. You know, I had to speculate, I don't know, at this moment, you know, and trace them. Hey, maybe what, tomorrow what, what, I, what I was just seeing, uh, Doug Buford or whoever, you, you know, Joe Girard at that time, I don't know. Of course, if it was Doug Buford, he had called you about the money. But I, I know you're speculating. If you could right. think about that a little bit tonight. Sure. Let, let me spend, uh, spend some of my efforts in doing that, sir, please. Okay, thanks. Get back. Uh, we're about to wrap up because I said we'd be out of here at 6 o'clock. Mr. Waxman has uh, passed on his round, and so I'll be the last questioner, and then we'll start off tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. We'll try to do it as sharply as possible. Uh, let me ask uh, just a few questions here. Uh, Mr. Wong, yes, uh, Exhibit 25, if you can look at that real quickly. It's a memo of October, 9, uh, October 20th, 1993 from Mary Leslie to Mark Middleton. And uh, it's regarding early California business support for President Clinton. And the memo says, quote, Lippo gave one of the most significant single contributions throughout the campaign. Do you know what Ms. Leslie, Ms. Leslie was talking about? Uh, I'm still trying to find the exhibit 25, sir. It's exhibit number 25. It's at the very end of the tab section. Oh, very end. Very end, they said. Here it is. Got it? Okay. Okay, we got it. Thank you, sir. She says, Lippo gave one of the most significant single contributions throughout the campaign. Do you know what she's talking about? It was, she wrote that memo to Mark Middleton. I don't know exactly what she was talking about. I can, I can think because uh, Chairman, you were referring to ch check with the previous exhibits. There's a list of the employee, uh, Lippo executives who were making all the contribution during 1992, that period of time. Maybe they're talking about that. In what I'm episodes. trying to find out is, uh, was uh, Miss Leslie or Mark Middleton aware that this money was being laundered through conduits? They did not know. They did not know? They did not know. You're absolutely time. certain about I'm that? I'm absolutely at this okay. time. Let me ask you a little bit about your, your situation. What was your salary at the Lippo Bank? It's about, uh, uh, during that period of time, on average, probably around 120. That's uh, without bonus. Uh -huh. uh, exhibit number four is a journal entry for Hip Hing Holdings for June of 1994. Are these checks to you, which are around $2,200 twice a month, was that your salary checks from the Lippo Bank? Yes, at that time it was a hipping holding. Mm -hmm.
that was my uh, net after tax salary at that time. That's uh, gross is around seventy five thousand mm -hmm. uh, dollars, as I also reported, and uh, I also receive a uh, separate income uh, around the, the two hundred two thousand five hundred dollars a month separately. Uh, that went into my Hong Kong uh, Chinese bank accounts in U.S. dollars form. What was your bonus for 1992 from Lippo? You recall? The reporting on taxes, uh, I think it was $100,000 at that time. Now you, that, you received a $100,000 bonus? That's, that's including that uh, you know, re reimbursement for cover the, uh, the campaign contributions. So they did give you reimbursement for the campaign. Within that $100,000. Within that $100,000. So that was the money that you and your wife gave to the DNC and the DSCC. That's correct. Now, what was your bonus for 1993? And did that include also money like that? Th that is correct. Okay, well, then we don't need to have the exact amount. Exhibit number five is a June 27, 1994 letter to Roy Tirtaji, Tirtaji a managing director of Lippo Group, to John Wong. Does this accurately state the amount of your severance package from Lippo? That is correct, sir. Exhibit six is a Hip Hong Hip Hing uh, holdings check to you for two hundred and eighty four thousand seven hundred and ninety-eight dollars on July fifteenth. Is this a severance check you received from Lippo in July of nineteen ninety four? That is the net amount after the exhibit uh, five to the figure you're talking about, Mr. Chairman. So you had both of those? Not both, it's just one. Just the one, okay because this is a net after taxes. Okay, exhibit number seven is a September 94 uh, ledger entry from Hip Hang Holdings. W what does that amount listed to uh, tie bonus to gross represent? I have no idea on that. Well, this prior balance of 230000 does it does that represent part of the money that you received from LIPO for reimbursement for contributions? That 230000 It says prior balance of 230000 Uh Are you talking about... Is that a prior balance in his account? Oh, you're talking about the following page right out of the uh -huh. figures. It says okay. prior balance 230000 Is that a balance that's left in your account there? That is not my account, though. That's a Hipping account, right? Am I correct? From the list here is a Hipping holding account. Do you know what the 230000 was? It could be related to the bonus for the prior year, sir. I see. Okay, and the, uh, the $673,125, what does that represent? I don't know about that, sir. Did your severance package cover all political contributions by you and your wife for 1994? It did. It did. It did. Do all departing uh, employees at LIPO receive a severance package? I will not know what the other people's arrangements. You don't have any idea? Right. How much did it cost a year to maintain your two homes in California? Quite a lot. <laughs> I know I understand that, but do you have any idea how much? I'll tell you what, let's, let's just stop right there, and we'll start tomorrow morning, and we'll talk about your income and that sort of thing. Okay. With that, this, uh, gentlemen, I appreciate your tolerance. I appreciate your... Uh, staying awake so long, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock uh, a.m. The committee okay. stands in recess. Thank you.
up, White House Press Secretary Joe Lockhart reviews the Israeli-Syria peace talk.